Over the past few months, I've tasked myself with one goal, and that's to find out what the best definitive Spider-Man animated series is. Now, over the course of this journey, I've watched every episode of every Spider-Man animated series, going all the way back to the 1960s to the most recent series in 2017, and after watching all of that, I think I have a definitive answer. Along with finding out what the best series is, I've also tasked myself with ranking them in order of how much I like them, all the way to how much I don't like them, on a tier list as usual. In my opinion, since there's so many different series, nine to be exact, the quality of the story, the storytelling, and the overall character of Spider-Man and Peter Parker drastically ranges from really high highs to really low lows. For as long as I can remember, I've always been a huge fan of Spider-Man, and after watching all of these series, I truly had no idea how many different interpretations there are and how drastically different each interpretation gets. Throughout this video, you'll see me review all nine animated series and I feel like if you're a fan of Spider-Man in general or just a fan of superheroes in general, at least one of these series will resonate with you and you'll find something you enjoy out of at least one of them. So if you've been a fan of the channel, you've been around and watched some of my videos before, you know I've reviewed all these series in the past and this is just one big compilation of all my other past reviews. I'm going to pop in again at the end and give my final closing thoughts on the series and tweak some of my opinions that I might have had at the time when recording those other videos. But because this is a mashup of my other videos, in the description there'll be links to each individual series review if you want to just check that out. But without further ado, let's get into one of my favorite animated series, Ultimate Spider-Man. The Spectacular Spider-Man is arguably, if not, the definitive best Spider-Man TV show. The reason that this show is beloved by so many fans in the Spider-Man community is due to the character development that each character gets. In the show's short two seasons, we see the Sinister Six form, along with Eddie Brock turn into Venom and Peter getting the symbiote suit, and a new take on the Green Goblin, which portrays Peter's best friend, Harry Osborn, as the Green Goblin. There's nothing I can really say to give enough praise to the Spectacular Spider-Man show that hasn't already been said a million different times on the internet. Now, if this show is obviously so beloved by many fans, what happened? Why was there only two seasons? Well, after Disney and Marvel acquired some of the rights to Spider-Man from Sony, all the existing Spider-Man projects that were happening just dropped. And that included the Amazing Spider-Man movies and, of course, the Spectacular Spider-Man TV show. Since Disney then wanted to start making their own Spider-Man TV shows, that meant that Sony would have to pay Disney and Marvel each time one of their property was used in a production. This was a huge legal mess as you could imagine, and it resulted in a spectacular Spider-Man being cancelled. After the cancellation, in September of 2012, Disney released the first episode to their new Spider-Man show titled The Ultimate Spider-Man. Now I am probably one of the only few Spider-Man fans that will give this show praise. In full transparency, I know that I am wholeheartedly blinded by nostalgia when it comes to this show. And that's because when I watched this show, I was the peak prime audience for this show. I was in middle school and my 11 year old brain couldn't process what good or bad media was. All I knew at the time is when I saw Spider-Man, I got so excited. So this show really came out at the perfect time for me. And what I'm going to be doing in this video is just discussing one of my all time favorite Spider-Man shows, The Ultimate Spider-Man. I know that this show has some problems and a lot of them, but before I explain to you why I love this show so much, let's just go ahead and get into the problems that I actually have with this show. But if you wanted to watch a multiple hour long video essay going through every single flaw in this show, pointing out every little detail, this really isn't the video for you. Instead, I'm going to touch upon the three main flaws and criticisms I have mainly seen when talking about The Ultimate Spider-Man. By far the biggest and most annoying issue I have with this show is how kiddish it treats its audience and the jokes that they make. A vast majority of the jokes in this show, and at least the first few seasons, are essentially just family-friendly, cutaway family guy gags. This is by far the biggest gripe I've seen online with the whole series, but Peter constantly breaks the fourth wall as if he was Deadpool, but it's not really done in a comedic or funny way, more just in a cringe way, and there's really no reason that Peter Parker needs to be doing this. I think that the reason that he does this is you know how in Spider-Man comics when Peter is constantly talking to himself and there's those thought bubbles above his head? Well, those are used so that the reader can tell what Peter Parker is thinking instead of having Peter express his thoughts directly to another character. When this is used correctly, the reader builds up a personal relationship with Peter as if he's speaking directly to the viewer. And this is one of the reasons why Peter Parker and Spider-Man are so popular as a character. In many other shows, when Peter is by himself, he's constantly talking to himself, doing a dumb exposition dump, or he's just conveying his feelings to the audience. And this is not a crazy or absurd thing to do, especially in an animated TV show format. Well, what does the Ultimate Spider-Man do instead? Well, Peter is constantly doing freeze frames and breaking the fourth wall, looking directly at the camera and talking to his audience. This is essentially how freaking Dora does whenever she needs directions from her map. She looks directly at the camera and just asks a question and then waits. If this doesn't sound absolutely ridiculous, on top of the 99% of the jokes that are essentially just fourth wall breaks, these are all done in a very millennial, lol, zany type style joke. It is beyond cringe and cliche, and is extremely forced. 
There will be extremely serious situations in this show, and then Peter will just freeze frame and make the most cringe joke with his stupid bitmoji angel and devils on his shoulders. Oh my gosh, I completely forgot about the stupid angel and devils that keep showing up on Peter's shoulders. And for some reason, they are a reoccurrence throughout the whole show. Even towards the end of the show in the later seasons, it takes a more serious and mature tone, but for some reason they still have to have callbacks to the stupid zany millennial jokes, so they have Peter continue to break the fourth wall and tell these cringy jokes just to find a little place to put them in. I mean, I admit it gets much more tolerable in the last two seasons, but sadly it is still around, but I'm, I'm getting sidetracked. The second main problem I have with this show is the absurd amount of characters that Spider-Man is always working with. For the most part, besides the occasional team up, Spider-Man works solo. At the beginning of the show, Spider-Man is recruited by Nick Fury. Yeah, that's right, Nick Fury, and is told that in order for him to essentially become the ultimate Spider-Man and do a video game level up, he has to become a leader of this superhero team. This team includes the most shallow versions of Iron Fist, Luke Cage, Nova, and White Tiger. There are a few episodes that focus on each of these side superheroes, but having these four characters plus Spider-Man be your main characters in your series is very strange to me. I don't know why you would do that in a Spider-Man show. Compare this to the series' predecessor, The Spectacular Spider-Man, it's no wonder why this show wasn't received as well as Disney expected it to be. To me, in the early seasons, it felt like every episode or every other episode was just like a Hero of the Week team-up, and the writers had to find a way to have Spider-Man team up with Captain America, or Wolverine, or even the freaking Guardians of the Galaxy. Peter Parker, in almost every single other adaptation of the character, is this smart, independent nerd who just works by himself and creates his own gadgets and techs, and then usually from an encounter with a villain that he ends up losing, he learns from those mistakes and builds his own tech. For example, let's say Peter fights Electro for the first time and he gets shocked a lot, right? And then he loses. His big takeaway from that will be that his suit needs to become insulated, that way Electro's electricity won't affect him as much as it did. Then, in his next encounter with Electro, he will be much more prepared and he'll know how to defeat him based on what he did wrong in the first encounter. Well, in this show, Peter gets recruited by S.H.I.E.L.D. and is constantly getting these tech upgrades by S.H.I.E.L.D. The formula of Peter failing and then learning from his mistakes and eventually overcoming the villain seems to ultimately be thrown out to make Peter this more immature and ignorant version of what Peter Parker normally is. And this really leads me to the third problem I have with this show. Peter Parker's reliance on tech in this show, and especially tech from S.H.I.E.L.D., is definitely the most annoying part from his character perspective. The fourth wall breaking and millennial zany jokes are definitely migraine inducing, but having Peter be this bumbling fool who is always looking to S.H.I.E.L.D. as his daddy to come save him from problems is the worst thing. Peter is constantly getting these tech upgrades from S.H.I.E.L.D. and he never knows how to use them. Instead of Peter building his tech on a basis of when he needs to and then figuring out how to use it, you know, kind of like a skill tree in a video game, in this show, Peter Parker is just randomly given things like a spider cycle, even though he swings on those webs, he doesn't need a spider cycle. Or he's given things like an iron spider suit. It gets to the point with the iron spider suit that even one of his friends realizes how incompetent he is with the suit, and he just straight up steals it from Peter. And no, he never gives it back. It's laughable. What makes Peter Parker's Spider-Man different from all the other Spider-Man, in my opinion, is how smart he is and the use of his own tech that he himself builds. This is what I think makes him stand out from the other Spider-Man like Miles, but when Peter doesn't know how to use his own tech, he just makes him a laughable joke of a character. Now there's a lot more problems that I have with this show, but I'm not here to rip into every single flaw that this show has. I actually really like this show. So again, if you want to watch a multiple hour long video essay ripping into the show, this isn't the video for you. You can just leave. That being said, let's get into what I love about this show, and we're going to start with The Webbed Warriors. Now, I know I literally just said I don't like it when Spider-Man works with the team, but this is literally the one exception. Season 3 is titled The Web Warriors, and it focuses around Peter Parker, Flash Thompson, who is Agent Venom, Ben Riley as the Scarlet Spider, and Amadeus Cho as the Iron Spider. That was his friend from earlier. Oh, and there's also Miles Morales, who for some reason is called Kid Arachnid in this show. In my opinion, Season 3 is where this show hits its peak. Season 4 is very good as well, but Season 3 is just so amazing. Season 3 follows Peter as he joins the Avengers, and then some nonsense happens with Loki and a Venom symbiote. It's, it's a whole different arc. And then Flash Thompson ends up bonding with the symbiote and becomes Agent Venom. That's like the best part of that arc. But Season 3 follows that, and then following those events, Amadeus Cho finds a way to get a hold of the Iron Spider suit from Peter after his incompetence with the suit. And then the three of them take on the Goblin and some of his goons. After the battle with the Green Goblin takes place, the Siege Perilous, which is this like MacGuffin crystal device that allows the user to travel to different universes and stuff, Goblin then takes the Siege Perilous and portals to a different dimension where he's trying to get all different spider people's blood throughout the multiverse. Our three heroes then jump in the portal after Goblin and we go on this multiverse 
story with them. In the next four episodes, our heroes meet Spider-Man 2099, Spider-Girl, Spider-Man Noir, Spider-Ham, Spider-Knight, and then Miles Morales. By the way, Miles Morales in this show is voiced by Donald Glover, and it's, it's just perfect. Throughout these four episodes, each time we visit a new universe, the art style and animation style changes, and it, it's just so beautiful. I'm going to put some examples up on the screen right now. This arc is by far my favorite arc in the whole series, and if you haven't even watched the show or don't want to, I just highly recommend that you watch these four episodes in season three, and then if you want to go back to the rest of the show, you can, but at least just watch these four episodes, because it's honestly insane, and the whole storyline is very condensed to this just one arc. Season three covers the Spider-Verse, the Guardians of the Galaxy, both a Christmas and Halloween episode with Moon Knight, along with a whole nother part four storyline dealing with the Contest of Champions. It, it's just so good. I love season three. Season 3 is everything I love about this show, and it just brings me to the last thing I have to say about this show. If you were to hear that there's a Marvel TV show with Spider-Man, all of his iconic villains, the Avengers, Loki, Guardians of the Galaxy, Cloak and Dagger, Moon Knight, Doctor Strange, Squirrel Girl, the Grandmaster, just to name a few, you would probably think this is just like a Marvel show, or a show about a Marvel animated universe. But no, this is a freaking Spider-Man show, and it has all of these characters. If you want to argue that this is a Spider-Man show, leave all the other Marvel characters out of it and just stick to the Spidey villains, I agree. I 100% am right there with you. That's the best way to do a Spider-Man show, and I think that's where Spectacular stands out. But at this point, it's extremely obvious that this is not the direction that the showrunners wanted to take with the Ultimate Spider-Man. And if you want to watch a show like that, go watch the 90s animated series as well, or Spectacular. They are both phenomenal. That being said, I got to a certain point when watching the show that I just started to embrace that this is the universe we're in, this is where the story is taking place, and this is a different Spider-Man story. Heck, Peter ends up teaching at the end of the series an X-Men-styled S.H.I.E.L.D. Academy show where Rhino, Rhino, is a student there, and he's now studying to be a hero. This is not the traditional Spider-Man story, but as soon as I started to accept that this is a different take on the character and a whole different universe, the more I started to enjoy this show for what it was, something different. I mean, it's an animated TV show that premiered on Disney XD. It's not going to be peak cinema. Don't get me wrong, content geared towards kids still needs to be good and is not an excuse by any means to be lackluster or lazy. But if you watch this series, by the time you get to season 3, you can tell this isn't a traditional Spider-Man story and is made for kids, so you might as well just enjoy it. Lastly, one of my overall favorite parts of this show has to be the villains. The villains in this show are amazing, no pun intended. We get a whole season based on Spider-Man fighting the Sinister Six, and throughout the season the members of the Sinister Six keep changing because Spider-Man keeps defeating them. The decision to make Doc Ock the final antagonist in the show is so cool in my mind. I mean, this design for the character is peak. I don't care what you have to say, this is peak Doc Ock costume and design in my opinion. This show throws so many different villains at you throughout the four seasons that the majority of my Spider-Man villain knowledge came from this show when I was a kid. I mean, have you ever heard of the Beatle? Well, I really never did until I watched this show, but the Beatle is this random guy in an Iron Man-like suit shaped like a beetle, and he has no business in this show besides being an unrelenting villain and menace towards Spider-Man. This is a character that I have not seen in many other forms of media, but this show makes him one of the main antagonists. Well, main side antagonist. This is one of the many examples of different side villains that gets depth to their character and is fleshed out to be more than just a one-dimensional bad guy. The fact that this show pulls off so many different obscure comic book villains is just insane. There's a whole Wikipedia page dedicated to the villains in this show, and it is so long it has to be listed alphabetically. Really, the only gripe I have with the villains is how they did Venom a little dirty early on in the show, but he ended up having a twist that Harry is Venom, and honestly, it's so fun. And the fact that they did this a decade before Spider-Man 2 on the PS5, I just have to give points to the show for that. The anti-Venom arc in this show is done so much better than it was in the game anyways. The last thing I'm going to say about the villains in this show is that I really enjoy Norman Osborn's character in this show. During the show, we watch Norman go from this kind of good guy to a kind of evil Iron Patriot, and then of course he turns into the Green Goblin. His goblin is so fun to watch because he goes from this traditional guy in a goblin suit to this fully hulkish monster goblin, and I just, I love it. Then when we're in another dimension and we meet Miles, the goblin in that universe is this full-blown kaiju green goblin monster with wings. That doesn't really last long, but the fact that we got to see it was so cool. And then at the end of Norman's arc, he's ultimately defeated and gets the standard comic book amnesia and then forgets who he ever was. Last video I talked about how I'd like to write a script for Tom Holland's Spider-Man 4 and the movies moving forward for him. And I know it's very unrealistic, but I would love to see the MCU's Spider-Man fight this type of goblin in one of his upcoming movies. 
I mean, imagine Tom Holland finds this universe's version of Norman, and he thinks he's going to be the same suit goblin type goblin from No Way Home, and then he just gets attacked out of nowhere from this brooding Hulk-like monster goblin. That would be such a fun take on the character. All in all, The Ultimate Spider-Man is definitely a flawed show, there's no denying that, but it's also one of my favorite childhood shows to just look at and enjoy it for what it is. If this show isn't for you, then honestly, I totally understand. But where I was at in life when this show came out, I was at the perfect demographic to enjoy this show. This show has some really good arcs that I think almost any viewer will admit if they sit down and take the time to watch it. Even if you were hate watching it, just watch the show and let me know what you think. If you haven't watched this show or are kind of on the fence if you should watch the show or not, I'm going to put a few arcs on screen right now that I highly suggest you watch and at least watch those and then you can decide if you want to watch the rest of the show. On November 19th, 1994, Fox Kids Network aired the first episode of Spider-Man the Animated Series. In this show's four-year run, and over the course of five seasons and 65 total episodes, this show fundamentally shaped a whole generation, if not multiple generations, public view of Spider-Man. Now this show by no means is responsible for how popular and successful the character of Spider-Man is, but this show 100% helped elevate Spider-Man's publicity to a whole nother level at the time. Spider-Man the Animated Series was not the first Spider-Man TV show, but I think the Animated Series was able to amount to a level of success that the TV shows that came before them were never able to achieve. In the 20th century, due to the limitations of animation at the time, even though there were prior Spider-Man TV shows that came before the animated series, like the 1960s show simply titled Spider-Man, and the more successful but lesser known spin-off, Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends, these shows were never able to achieve as much or strike a chord with the audience as hard as the animated series was able to. And on top of that, the animated series was the first of its kind, tying in previous existing TV shows, creating the first ever cinematic universe with the 90s X-Men series. This is one of the many reasons that Spider-Man the Animated Series was so successful and beloved by many fans. So stick around as we take a look back and review Spider-Man the Animated Series. But before we get into that, I'm starting my first ever series on this channel where I'm going to be personally watching, reviewing, and ranking every Spider-Man TV show. Now I already made a video and reviewed The Ultimate Spider-Man, so if you want to know my opinion on that show, then check out this video that I'll link to the screen right now. Now I'm going to go ahead and just put that show at B tier. Again, if you want to know my explanation on why I think that way, then go ahead and watch the video. Now let's just get into reviewing the Animated Series. As stated earlier, Spider-Man the Animated Series first aired in 1994, but to fully understand the importance of the show, we have to go back to the early 90s. The creation of the show started in the 90s when Marvel Comics was going bankrupt. After the creation of comic books and the boom that came with successes like Batman, Superman, the X-Men, and then of course Spider-Man, in the 1970s, collecting different types of comics became a type of investment for the public. During the Copper Age of Comics, more iconic covers were being created and developed and sold for extreme prices. Examples of these comics were Secret Wars that featured the black suit Spider-Man, or Batman the Killing Joke, and then of course the death of Superman, which was actually sold in like a special black plastic packaging. Because of the boom in demand for special editions or alternative covers, Marvel and DC artists were becoming sort of like micro-celebrities. And then, of course, after a while, fatigue began to set in and the big bubble burst, and no one was really reading comic books anymore. It was actually just the diehard fans that were reading them, and that left Marvel Comics specifically in a huge amount of comic book debt, where comics had been written and printed and the artists had been paid for them, but the public had no interest in getting the comics. They already had their little comic book fix. So, people ultimately stopped buying comics for a while, and because of this, Marvel Comics again was in a large amount of debt with unsold comics that had already been printed along with stock price and sales plummeting. Now, enter in Toy Biz CEO, Avi Arad. If you've been following Spider-Man Media for the past decade or so, then you should be familiar with this name. At the time, after hearing that Fox Kids Animation was going to be making their own Spider-Man animated TV show, Avi signed on as the show's executive producer and was quoted as saying he would like the series to just be one big toy commercial. The reason he wanted the show to be one big toy commercial is so his company would create and then produce the toys, of course, and sell them to the public. It's also full public knowledge that Avi wanted to create a show for all of the Marvel characters so he could ultimately sell more toys, but this meant there was a lot riding on the backs of the show to be successful. If this show was a big hit, then ultimately they would revive Marvel's reputation in the public eye and set them up for big time success. Even though Avi's mainstream motive through his entire infamous history with Marvel and Spider-Man specifically is driven by the motivation to sell toys, most notably known for him forcing Sam Raimi to shove Venom into Spider-Man 3 so more Venom toys would be sold of course, but Avi needed this show to be a big success. There was a lot riding on the show's back at the time. Luckily for Avi and the team involved, the show was an amazing hit. Not to say that this was an easy feat. The show had to navigate their way through a monstrosity worth of limitations and censorship from the network. And this leads me to what I believe is the show's most infamous part, that being their limitations and censorship. Allow me to share you some of my favorite ones before we get into all of that. 
Throughout the show, Spider-Man is never allowed to punch someone directly. Morbius was never allowed to suck blood, so instead he had to take plasma from people using his suction cups on his hands instead of his fangs, because, you know, he's a vampire. And my most favorite example of the show's censorship being so harsh is that the Sinister Six, you know, Spider-Man's most, like, famous rogues gallery of villains, I don't know, <laughs> they were referred to as the Insidious Six. Now, why is Insidious better than Sinister? I don't know, but the network thought that Sinister sounded too evil for kids to hear. And if you thought these were bad, the show also couldn't allow people to break through any glass, whether that be, like, windows or car glass breaking. They couldn't say the words kill, death, or die, and the network only allowed laser guns, not traditional, like, bullet-powered guns. People in the show are also not allowed to die on screen, so if you had a character that died, they would die off screen, or you would just hear through dialogue like, oh yeah, that character's dead now. And then lastly, Carnage, or his human counterpart, Cletus Cassidy, was not a serial killer in the show like he traditionally is. Instead, he was a lunatic. But gladly, despite the multiple network censorship and the behind the scenes drama, this show is a massive hit and a huge success. And it was just the thing Marvel needed at the time to jolt them back to life. Now, enough talking about the show's actual real life implications and what happened behind the scenes. Let's get to reviewing and recapping the whole show, starting with season one. So the official synopsis for the show reads as the following. The animated series chronicles the story of a single 19-year-old Peter Parker attending his first year at Empire State University. Trying to get through his part-time job as a photographer for the Daily Bugle, adjusting to his new relationships, and growing into his newfound alter ego as the Amazing Spider-Man. Now, in my opinion, this is a very simple and grounded way to start off a Spider-Man series, so right out the gate, we're off to a great start. Within the first episode, we're introduced to Peter, of course, J. Jonah Jameson, Dr. Kirk Connors, and his alter ego, The Lizard, and Eddie Brock. One thing I have to commend this show for before we can continue is the world building. This show made my childhood and was one of the many main reasons that I'm so familiar with Spider-Man's rogue gallery and then Marvel characters as a whole. The Fantastic Four, the Avengers, and the Defenders are all name dropped in episode one, which to my mind is absolutely insane, especially in the 90s. Now, you might think this might be in a bloated way, but it's actually done in a really smooth way that doesn't feel like we're being force-fed into this lore and exposition and world building. It's all done in a very natural way. Within the first episode, we keep going back to and are introduced to the Lizard, Doc Ock, Kraven, Mysterio, Scorpion, Smythe, and of course, the most important villain in the series of all, Kingpin. After these quick introductions, we get the first arc of the series titled The Alien Costume, Part 1, 2, and 3. And as you guessed it, yeah, this has to do with Venom. Now, my first major gripe with this show is that they introduced the Venom storyline way too soon. They should have been something in like the later seasons, but it's pretty early on in season one. And the TLDR is that in the three episode arc, it's pretty standard Spider-Man stuff. Peter gets the symbiote, he gets the black suit, and then of course over a few weeks, he slowly succumbs to the symbiote and starts becoming more evil. And then, you know, Peter recognizes what's going on, he gets the suit off him, Eddie Brock gets the symbiote, yada 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 turns into Venom, and then he's defeated. Pretty standard stuff, like I said. But I can't knock it too much because we get this amazing iconic line delivered from Peter's voice actor, Christopher Daniel Barnes. Shocker! You can't escape me! I'll chase you to the ends of the earth! Now, this isn't a bad arc by any means, I just think it's way too early on in the show to do Venom, but what I'm thinking happened is Avio Rod wanted to get that sweet, sweet Venom action figure money early on in the toy sales, so he said, hey, let's just throw in Venom, because you know, the show is just one big toy commercial. At the end of the season, we get a two-episode arc with the Hobgoblin, and then the final episode serving as the season finale with the Chameleon. I'll talk about the decision to make the Hobgoblin arc before the Green Goblin later, but this episode with the Chameleon is honestly so good. Chameleon, when he's done right, is such a great villain and is one of my favorite Spider-Man villains. This episode solidifies that pretty early on in the series. And then as we close out of season one, we see Peter Parker chasing MJ off into the sunset. Pretty cute standard stuff. Season one is very standard, safe, by the book Spider-Man stuff, so I really don't have a whole lot to say about this season as a whole. It's just, it's pretty good. Hey, that's pretty good. Now, here's a quick overview of season two. The season starts off with the infamous Insidious Six in a two-part episode arc. The team follows the Chameleon, Mysterio, Scorpion, Rhino, Shocker, and then of course is led by Doc Ock. Later on in the season, we'll see villains like Hydro Man, who is a fan favorite of mine, and I honestly feel like we don't see him a whole lot in other Spider-Man media, so it was good seeing him. And then we get what I can only describe as like multiple team-up episodes, and this is what I meant when the show really fleshed out the Marvel Universe as a whole, and little Cody absolutely loved this. During these team-up episodes, we see people like the Wolverine, the Punisher, and Blade. The main theme that I think season 2 deals with the most has to be body horror. 
For a good chunk of the season, we follow Dr. Michael Morbius as he gets turned into a vampire, and we witness a heartbreaking love story unfold between Morbius and his girlfriend. Morbius is constantly torn between his flesh and his desire for blood, and his heart just not wanting to go down this evil path, but he has a physical desire for it and he has to succumb to that. It's a truly heartbreaking story to watch and ultimately understand more as an adult. Another example of body horror in this arc is Peter gets turned into the human-sized spider, and then Morbius even gets turned into a bigger, more monster-sized vampire. There's a few episodes that also deal with body horror, with Dr. Connor's tragic transformation back into the lizard. Then, in the season 2 finale, Peter deals with the vultures stealing his youth, resulting in Peter turning into an old man. Again, here's a reoccurring theme of body horror. And since the vultures stole Spider-Man's DNA, and with him still having part of that man-spider, like, monster-esque thing in him, he the vulture then transformed into this nightmarish, like, human-sized vulture, nightmare, monster, vampire, spider thing. It's, it's, it's honestly so terrifying. And then, of course, Peter ultimately defeats his enemies, and then we move into season 3. But before we get into season 3, I really just want to talk about my overall takeaway from season 2. This season dealt with a whole lot more mature adult themes that I did not pick up on as a child when watching this show. As I started doing research for this video and rewatching the series, I was shocked to see how many complex and compelling and mature storylines there are in this show. Let's take the Morbius arc that I just spoke about for example. If you take the time to watch this arc, it's a tragic love story of someone who just wants to be with his girlfriend, but after being transformed into a vampire, He's no longer the man that he once was, and his girlfriend, his true love, wants nothing to do with him. This is nothing like the Morbius movie that came out. It's very well done. Now, going back and watching these episodes as an adult gave me a whole new appreciation for these stories in this series, and I honestly cannot recommend them enough. Please watch this show if you have not. Now, let's get into Season 3. Like I said a few seconds ago, Season 3 introduces us to a more mystical side of the world building. We meet Doctor Strange and we get a nice two episode arc dedicated to him, and it's cute and it's fun, but man I cannot take my eyes off this Doctor Strange design. This is peak, it looks so good and I just I love it so much. We're then introduced to no other than the Green Goblin, when coincidentally Norman Osborn dies in an explosion at Oscorp, and after the Green Goblin starts flying around, we as the audience start to question if Harry is actually the Goblin, because you know, Norman is out of the picture. We get a fantastic episode where it's revealed that Norman was involved in the previous explosion, but because of this he was exposed to goblin gas, and then finding the hobgoblin's tech from early on in the show, he became the Green Goblin. This is cheesy, but I kinda like it. It's a different origin story to the Green Goblin, but again, this show can do whatever it wants. It's not anything like special, it's its own origin, and I think if you kind of change the backstory of characters, as long as it's done in the right way, then I'll let it slide. Norman and the Green Goblin is ultimately defeated by Spider-Man, and he gets this dumb version of comic book amnesia where Spider-Man says that Norman doesn't remember who he is because the Green Goblin's defeated and all this type of stuff. And again, I don't really love this type of like comic book amnesia trope where the villain gets defeated and he doesn't remember who he was like in Spider-Man 3, but this is a kid's cartoon, so I'll let this one slide as well. It, it's okay. The next arc in Season 3, Peter gets framed for treason by Kingpin's son, and I would only imagine that this is a workaround for the censorship not being able to say murder. Peter getting, like, framed for treason versus getting framed for murder. Like, come on, we know what's going on here. But Peter's lawyer is then no other than, of course, Mac Murdock, and over the course of the two-episode arc, we get a good Spider-Man and Daredevil team up as they take down Kingpin's son, Alistair Smythe, and ultimately clear Peter Parker's name. At the end of these episodes, there's a cute little moment where Matt Murdock knows that Peter is Spider-Man because of his like enhanced senses and stuff, but he doesn't say anything, so the interaction between them is so wholesome and cute. I love it. Peter's like, oh, or I mean, Spider-Man's like, oh, I wonder who that Daredevil guy is, and then Daredevil is like, I don't know, but make sure to tell your friend Peter Parker he's a good guy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny. It's cute. I love it. Then in like standard like superhero and even just like TV show fashion, we get like a villain of the week. We get two episodes, two villain of the week style episodes with Tombstone and then the spot as well. It's the spot in this is he's a meme. He's not like what the spot is in the Spider-Verse films. Then the final two episodes of the season are titled Goblin War and Turning Point. The arc starts off with Peter and MJ expressing their love to one another and finally becoming like a good couple, right? But MJ says how she's nervous to be around Peter because in the past she's always being involved in attacks with like Hydra-Man, Venom, Dormammu, and all these other villains and she wants to keep Peter Parker safe because 
her job is as a reporter, she's always being involved in this. And Peter explains to her, like, listen, babe, you got nothing to worry about. I will keep you safe. And so we're then introduced once again back to the Hobgoblin. But this time he has this device that allows him to travel to other dimensions and more importantly, suck other people and objects into the the Hobgoblin then uses his device to like start robbing banks and doing other standard bad guy stuff, but he then goes to Kingpin and says he needs his help. Later on, Kingpin kidnaps Norman Osborn, and when Osborn awakes, he sees that he's back at Oscorp and he's having flashbacks to being the Green Goblin. And if you're a Spider-Man fan, then you obviously know where this is going. Norman gets drugged and gets turned back into the Green Goblin, and over the course of the two episodes, the two goblins fight for control of the device, and ultimately the OG Green Goblin wins, and he takes the device. Now, after a long fight, the Green Goblin tries to use the portal device that the Hobgoblin had to escape Spider-Man and the Hobgoblin, and he's told that the device is on low battery or something like that, and if he attempts to use the device, he could get trapped in limbo, which is like this weird interdimensional place where if you're trying to portal somewhere and you get stuck, you're stuck in limbo. It's, it's hard to explain. But the Green Goblin then says it's better to be trapped in limbo than be trapped by Spider-Man. So the Green Goblin uses the device and he escapes. And at the end of the episode, it's revealed that he successfully was able to teleport and he vows to get revenge on Spider-Man, Kingpin, and the Hobgoblin. And then over the course of the last episode, the Green Goblin stalks Spider-Man until he finally finds that his true identity is Peter Parker. The Green Goblin decides the best way to get his revenge on Peter is by ruining every part of his everyday life. That, of course, includes Aunt May and MJ. And then over the episode, we get the Green Goblin emotionally tormenting Peter Parker, where he plays this game of like cat and mouse, not knowing if the Green Goblin's gonna attack Aunt May next or attack MJ. And so they're always going back and forth. As soon as Peter tries to save MJ and make sure she's fine, he's like, well, now I have to go check on Aunt May. And so they go back and forth. This ultimately culminates in MJ getting kidnapped and taken to the top of the George Washington Bridge. This, this part's important. So here we're at this really interesting comic book style Green Goblin fight where the Green Goblin is constantly switching between being Norman and the Goblin. And at the end of the fight, MJ falls off the bridge, but right before she hits the water in the river, the time dilution device transports her to another dimension. But because Peter was fighting the Goblin, he thinks MJ fell in the water. And Peter not being able to find MJ anywhere in the river is heartbroken because he believes that his love has drowned. This causes him to go ballistic and continue fighting the goblin. At the end of the fight, the time dilation device is now broken, causing the, like this imbalance in the portal, sucking the green goblin inside and then closing shortly after. Now, the green goblin and MJ are both stuck in limbo. Defeated and broken, Peter has a breakdown as we close out in season three. But right before the episode in the season ends, we get this final horrifying shot of MJ screaming for help as she travels through limbo, except no one can hear her. This by far had the most impactful ending to any season in my mind. Rewatching this again as an adult genuinely upset me because there's nothing Peter can do. I, I tr truly empathize with him. I can't do this show enough justice again, so please, if you haven't watched this show, make time to do this in the future. I cannot recommend it enough. Season 4 is the shortest season in the show by far, but in my opinion it deals with some of the most emotional storylines we have in this whole series. This story wastes no time at all and we pick up right where we left off in Season 3. Peter's grieving from dealing with the loss of MJ, and having no one else to turn to, he goes to his friend Felicia Hardy to talk about his loss. As Peter stalks Felicia to her apartment, he sees Doc Ox upstairs talking to Felicia's mother and making some sort of deal with them. So, so then naturally Spider-Man arrives to the scene and Doc Ock flees. Later on in the episode, we get a little bit of shenanigans with Captain America doing a team up with Spider-Man, and we fight the Red Skull, Kingpin, and Doc Ock. This culminates in Felicia getting captured and injected with the Super Soldier Serum, transforming her into the Black Cat. Now, I for one am not the biggest Black Cat fan, so I don't know all of her standard lore, but it always puzzled me how she has the skills that she does and she can move and continue to fight crime the way she does. But for some reason, I just haven't looked into her power set or backstory, so I don't know her true origin story or skill set. That being said, I really do like this explanation for her getting her powers in the series. It's very simple and standard. Kingpin wants to get back at Felicia's father, so he injects her with this, like, serum to get the information out of her, and then, you know, bada bing, bada boom, now she has powers. It's pretty easy and simple. So, that's all you really need to know about the start of the season, and now, Black Cat's around. So, the next few episodes follow Spider-Man and Black Cat working together, and then Kraven shows up and is quickly defeated by the two. Nothing really need to focus on with that. So, the fun is then ruined when Smythe kidnaps, or should I say catnaps, Black Cat? I'm, I'm sorry, I had to say that, but after being saved, Black Cat asks Peter if they're truly just partners or they're just a convenience that they were working together. And so Peter says how he really cares about her and Black Cat lifts up his mask just enough to kiss him and then she swings off. After leaving, Peter's then conflicted with his emotions. 
He's still grieving from the loss of MJ, but he realizes that he eventually has to move on and he's starting to catch feelings from Black Cat. Shortly after, Maurice's body is found in hibernation and he's brought back to New York City, where then Dr. Connors proclaims to the press that he can revert him from his monster body form back to his human form. This experiment works, but only momentarily, reverting Michael Morbius back to his vampire form. Unknown to everyone, Kingpin is the one who's facilitating this plan and is spying on Morbius and Dr. Connors so he can ultimately get Morbius' DNA to become immortal. After being awoken from hibernation, Morbius flees the scene. Black Cat then finds him and reveals to him that she's his long-lost love, Felicia. Morbius tells him to go away and that she he's a monster, but due to the state she's in, she will do anything to help him. I forgot to mention early on, but when I was talking about the Morbius arc in the previous seasons, his true love is Felicia Hardy, so that's why Peter hasn't really been like romantic with her and only sees her as a friend. But there is like an on and off again relationship with Felicia and Morbius. This storyline then culminates with Morbius being transformed from his monster vampire form back to his human vampire form, where he then flies away, promising not to harm any of his loved ones. To finish out the series in this whole vampire plot, the next few episodes follow Black Cat, Morbius, and Blade as they take on a super vampire named Miriam who turns a whole lot of people in the city into vampires. And then after temporarily defeating Miriam, all the vampires go back to normal humans and Miriam flies away. After all of this, Morbius, Blade, and Black Cat say they're going to leave New York in hopes of tracking down Miriam across the globe and ending him for good. Spider-Man, after hearing all of this, tells Black Cat that he wants to go with her, but she reassures him that he's the defender of New York City and he has to stay here and protect New York. Peter reluctantly then agrees as he watches Black Cat leave with Blade and Morbius. Like many Spider-Man fans, I like Black Cat for multiple reasons, but there's not a lot of media depicting Spider-Man and Black Cat's friendship and relationship. The Spider-Man game on the PS4 does a pretty decent job at this, but the show really makes me care about the characters way more than any other adaptation has. But now Peter is all alone, and he exclaims that Black Cat is gone, MJ is gone, and his friend Felicia Hardy is gone too, so Peter really has no one to turn to, but he reassures himself that it has to get better from here because he feels as if he's at rock bottom and things can only go up from here. I for one prefer my Spider-Man stories to be more grounded, so I'm not a huge fan of this version and like this specific Morbius subplot with all the vampires. But I'd be lying if I said I didn't feel bad for Peter here. After Black Cat leaves him, he's all alone once again, and he's reminded again that things have to get better, and that he's ultimately making a heroic sacrifice by one, choosing to stay and do the right thing, but also not chasing after just a physical romantic relationship with Black Cat. This is also an arc that I recommend checking out, purely just for the ending. Now, here we are at the end of Season 4 with the much-anticipated return of the Green Goblin. The story starts off with Harry getting visions from the Green Goblin, and then we, as well as him, find out that the Green Goblin is stuck in this sort of limbo state that we last saw him in, but he's somehow able to communicate with Harry. The Goblin says that if Harry does what he says, he will help him find his father, Norman. The Goblin then leads Harry to where he will eventually expose himself to Goblin gas inside of Oscorp and slowly starts transforming him into the Goblin. While all this is going on, the Punisher is hired by Mary Jane's mother to help her find MJ since she's still missing. She says that she believes Peter Parker has something to do with the disappearance of Mary Jane and that's all really the Punisher needs to work off of, and that she just really wants to see her daughter. We then cut to Peter and Liz Allen deciding to bring Harry a pizza to cheer him up since he's been so depressed since his father disappeared. When they arrive to his apartment, they see an explosion at the top as they watch the Green Goblin fly out from his apartment on a glider. Peter realizes he has to go, so he leaves Liz and tells her to go upstairs as he swings off into action. After fighting the Goblin, Peter takes off the Goblin's mask to reveal that underneath it's not Norman, but instead Harry. Dumbfounded by this, Peter's stunned and kind of falls to the ground, which gives Harry enough time to escape. The next day, Peter Parker, not Spider-Man, but Peter goes to see Harry in his apartment. He finds that the door is unlocked, so he just kind of wanders in and starts snooping. He finds the location of six different goblin hideouts and decides to start investigating them, hoping to eventually find his friend. As Peter leaves the apartment, we see that the Punisher is stalking Peter throughout this whole process. Upon arriving at the first location, the Punisher meets Peter there and says that he was hired to investigate MJ and the three names that keep popping back up. Peter Parker, the Green Goblin, and Spider-Man. The Punisher says that these three names are pinned to MJ and that he believes Peter Parker is the Green Goblin. Peter then picks up a pair of goblin gauntlets next to him and shoots at the Punisher, and then tries to fly away on a makeshift goblin glider, but he's too slow because he doesn't know how to work it, and the Punisher shoots a missile at him where they fall down to the ground on a rooftop. After fighting for a little bit, the Green Goblin then flies over Peter and the Punisher, to which Peter looks up at the sky and says, that's not me, how could I be the Green Goblin if the Goblin's up there? Peter explains that he's just trying to find MJ as well, so he gives the Punisher the coordinates to the other locations of the Goblin bases that he's found, and then the Punisher leaves. 
Peter deduces that Harry's going to be going to Oscorp because that's where Norman's base of operations for everything was. We then cut to Harry talking to the Green Goblin inside of a mirror, saying that he just wants to find his father and have his father come back. He doesn't want to do any evil goblin stuff. Spider-Man then swings in and sees Harry talking to himself in the mirror, realizing that Harry's gone completely goblin and has gone crazy. Spider-Man explains that his father's not coming back and that he's the one that defeated the Green Goblin. Spider-Man explains that his father's not coming back because his father was the Green Goblin. Harry then looks in the mirror, asking the Goblin if this is correct, to which the Goblin pulls off his mask in the mirror to reveal his father's face. Going completely insane, Harry realizes that the only way to ever gain his father's respect is to fully embrace and become the Green Goblin. Harry then goes into Goblin mode and Spider-Man starts chasing him, realizing that he's being led to the same bridge that Norman and MJ disappeared at. Then the Punisher shows up and shoots a missile at the Green Goblin, causing Harry to fall into the same river. After searching for Harry in the river, Peter realizes that the same fate that happened to his father has also happened to Harry. Peter doesn't see this, but us the audience do as we watch the Punisher drag Harry's body from shore. Now we cut to Norman Osborn still in limbo as he explains what a failure his son is, and as he's getting upset right before we cut away, we see MJ walk on that same beach, whereas Norman and us the audience are just as confused wondering how MJ got on the shore. Later that night, while walking home, Peter exclaims that his life is getting worse. His friend Harry is now missing, MJ's still not been found, and he still isn't allowed to be with Black Cat. Peter opens the front door to his house where he sees the Punisher in his living room with Harry tied up. The Punisher points a gun at Peter and asks him one last time where MJ is, but before he can explain, the doorbell rings behind him, and us the audience as well as everyone in the living room is just as confused when we see that when Peter opens the door, MJ is standing there. But before she can explain what happened and how she's back, the Punisher rushes her off back to her house where she can be re reunited with her mother. So that ends the first episode of the season finale arc that reintroduces MJ back into the mix. The next episode in the arc is titled The Haunting of Mary Jane Watson. And you would think that this would just be like a really cool episode explaining the backstory of what happened to MJ and how she disappeared and how she was able to come back out of limbo. But sadly instead, this episode is more of a villain of the week episode with Mysterio showing back up. After the two get into multiple shenanigans, it's honestly not that good of an episode to watch, and the main takeaway from the episode is at the end, because after MJ, of course, is a damsel in distress, she's saved by Spider-Man, and Spider-Man reveals himself to be Peter Parker, and then we cut to black, and that's the end of the episode. Now, there's two more episodes in the season, but I don't consider them to be like season finales, because nothing really happens. One of the two episodes, again, is a Villain of the Week episode with the Prowler, and the other has Peter proposing to MJ where she finds out his secret identity from the previous episode. Now you might think to yourself, wow, that's important, why is that not part of like the season finale or whatever? Well, that's about 5% of the episode. The other 95% of the episode deals with Dr. Connors having these like adult lizard babies, and it's mid. It's, it's not that good. It's, you don't need to watch it. The only important thing to take away is that Peter proposed and MJ says yes. And then that's it. That's the end of season four. Overall, season four deals with some of the most emotional beats in the series, dealing with the interpersonal conflict between Peter not wanting to commit to Black Cat after mourning from MJ, and then wanting to chase after her after across the world, and then realizing that his best friend was turned into the monster that his father was, along with MJ returning from the dead, essentially. This isn't my favorite season in the show, I'd have to give that to season 5, but nonetheless this is a very very good enjoyable season, so again, highly recommend you watching this. So, We'll rank all the seasons at the end of season 5 once I review them, but this is a, it's a pretty good season, it's just not my favorite. Lastly, here we are the final season, season 5. The first episode of the season starts off with Peter and Mary Jane on their wedding day, and before they can get their happy ending, Harry Osborn, filled with jealousy and rage, crashes into the wedding as the Green Goblin. Over the course of this episode, Spider-Man and Black Cat team up to take down the Green Goblin and the Scorpion. At the end of the episode, everything gets resolved and we finally get Peter Parker and Mary Jane getting married. Peter and MJ are walking out of the church and J. Jonah Jameson stops Peter and hands him the keys to a new car. Honestly, watching this for the first time is such like a bittersweet moment seeing that like J. Jonah Jameson has a sweet spot and is giving Peter the keys to a new vehicle. But then it's kind of abrupted by finding out that the vehicle is just a Daily Bugle van. But I do appreciate the versions of J. Jonah Jameson that have a soft spot. And as the episode ends, we finally get the two happy couples driving off into the sunset. Now the first arc of the season starts off with Peter finding out that his parents were government agents. And I just have to say right at the gate that I hate this idea. And I hate the whole idea of like the backstory of Peter Parker's parents always trying to be someone important. Whether that be like 
government agents or shield agents and i mean we saw this in the amazing spider-man 2 and a lot of people don't like that movie and that subplot specifically so i i completely understand and honestly to make matters even worse this arc is it's pretty mid it's it's not great and i'm not a huge fan of it this arc revolves around spider-man teaming up with these like forgotten world war ii heroes as they go on this adventure fighting red skull with captain america and stuff and i mean it's cute watching spider-man get to work with these like older lesser heroes and he learns a few quotes from them and like learns the ropes and stuff but other than that it's not a, that interesting of an arc so if you're gonna like skip around and stuff you can skip this one over the course of this five episode arc i was constantly checking out and while re-watching the series for this video i i, I skipped this one i'm gonna be honest <laughs> This next arc though, this one, this arc is peak. And I'm not being hyperbolic when I say that this arc is more emotionally effective to me than the two arcs that are like the Secret Wars and Spider-Verse arc at the end of the season. So the title for this arc is called The Return of Hydro-Man. And to quickly summarize the events, Hydro-Man shows back up again after being defeated earlier on in the series. And he kidnaps Mary Jane right when he comes back. Bro's not playing around at all. So Peter, after having nightmares of Mary Jane disappearing, he figures out through the events of what happened in his nightmares exactly where Mary Jane was taken to. And after arriving at the location of this underwater science base, Spider-Man is introduced to Professor Miles Warren. And I'd like to say pretty confidently that I'm super familiar with a lot of Spider-Man characters in lore, but I'm not too familiar with Miles Warren. So if there's someone out there that knows more about him than I do, just let me know who he is, because I was blindsided by this reveal of like, who this scientist is. And so, spoiler alert, of course, the scientist is evil. And he explains that both the returning of Hydra-Man and MJ were orchestrated by him. MJ and Hydra-Man are both clones of the original versions of themselves, and he's been working on this cloning process. So both MJ and Hydra-Man have the memories of their original self, but again, they're just like clones. He says that MJ and Hydra-Man are essentially his Adam and Eve for his cloning process, and how he originally made Hydra-Man, but now he made MJ because Hydra-Man wanted MJ, kind of how Adam wanted Eve in the Bible. So this explains how MJ now has the same powers as Hydro-Man, and we see that Hydro-Man is heartbroken by this. He, the only reason he wants to be back is just to be with MJ because he's in love with her. And honestly, finding this out is such a heartbreaking revolution that this whole time as Peter and MJ have been reunited after she died or disappeared, that she's just been a clone this entire time, and a clone of Hydro-Man nonetheless. And to make matters worse, at the end of the episode and at the end of the arc, we get the most tragic and heartbreaking ending in, in all of Spider-Man media. At the end of this episode, the professor explains that during the cloning process, he messed up and the cloning process isn't perfect, and that both Hydro-Man and MJ's DNA is unstable and that they're about to start falling apart. Hydro-Man starts to evaporate and disintegrate, and in a fit of rage, he destroys the whole lab and all of the professor's research. And right after that, we cut to MJ on the floor, starting to evaporate as well. And here we get the most heartbreaking scene in all of Spider-Man media, in my opinion. Spider-Man's helpless. There's nothing he can do but sit back and watch the love of his life his wife, evaporate and die. Realizing that the real Mary Jane is never going to come back and the clone that he thought was her is also gone forever. Both voice actors in this put in a heartbreaking and amazing performance, and Peter's final cry for plea has struck with me for years since. Oh, Mary Jane! Now I'm not being hyperbolic when I say that this has stuck with me and that I've had actual dreams and nightmares of being in this situation. As a kid, I was terrified by this idea of watching the love of your life just disintegrate and evaporate in front of you and there's nothing you can do. And then after getting recently married this past year, I can only relate more and more to Peter, which only emphasizes how heartbreaking this episode is. And then we finally close out on the series as we're left in a truly heartbreaking mo Wait. No, 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 no. Actually, there's more. Yeah, now it's time for Secret Wars. And then Madam Web just spawns in at the end of the episode when Peter's heartbroken and sucks him into this portal and says that if you can help me, I'll help you find the real MJ. So now it's time for Secret Wars. And this begins with Spider-Man being transported in to meet the Beyonder, much like other Spider-Man and Secret Wars adaptations. The Beyonder then explains that Spider-Man is chosen to be a part of this experiment for a total battle of good versus evil. The Beyonder has this planet that has like no sin, no evilness and stuff, and he just wants to see who would ultimately win, good versus evil. And he announces that he already teleported and sent Doc Ock, Smythe, the Lizard, Red Skull, and of course Doctor Doom to the planet to go ahead and like introduce evil to the population. And that Spider-Man is going to be the leader for the good guys and that he's being able to... And Spider-Man being the leader of the good guys is able to choose his team to go fight the forces of evil. Spider-Man chooses the Fantastic Four, Iron Man, Captain America, and Storm. Now, why he chose Storm, I'm not too sure other than the fact that he like says she has a lot of powers. I thought he should have picked Wolverine, but you know, whatever. So then our team of heroes gets transported into the perfect planet of like the Beyonder, right? 
So after fighting the lizard, our team kidnaps him and is able to help him with the helps of Iron Man and Reed Richards. And they're able to perform this like lizard reverse sort of transformation thing where he's a smaller version of the lizard, but he's also kind of like Smart Hulk and Professor Hulk where he's stuck in the lizard body, but he has Dr. Connors' brains. So as the episode ends, Spider-Man says to Dr. Connors that he's going to record and journal this war so that quote unquote, the greatest war ever fought isn't a secret war. So that the greatest war ever fought isn't a secret war. Oh brother, this guy stinks! I'm gonna be honest, I think they were just padding for runtime with episode two because it's kind of filler in my opinion. But that being said, Fantastic Four goes after Doctor Doom and then the rest of the team with Captain America, Iron Man, the Lizard, Spider-Man, and then Black Cat because they find a way to like bring Black Cat into this. They all choose to go after Red Skull. And after Black Cat attacks the Red Skull on her own, she ends up getting kidnapped from the rest of the team and they have to rescue her and then the Red Skull escapes. That's essentially the whole arc of episode two, so you could kind of just skip it. It's it's pretty filler. So now we're in episode three of Secret Wars, and we see that this war hasn't been going on over the course of like a few hours, but this truly is a war and that everyone here has been feeling the effects of the bad guys and that this has been a war going on for months now. So Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four go to recapture the thing if he was previously captured in the previous episode from Doctor Doom. And we see that he's no longer in his thing, like rock form, but now that Ben Grimm's has been transformed into a human. He explains that Doctor Doom now has this newfound power and he's able to manipulate and transform matter out of thin air. Doctor Doom then kidnaps all the rest of the heroes that were not involved in this and explains how he now has part of the Beyonder's powers. And because of this, he's created essentially his own utopia on this planet and where he can essentially be a god as well. And he says how he wants to stay here and live in harmony with the rest of the heroes. And of course the heroes don't agree with this, so then he sends them all away. Then while the rest of the team is thinking of what to do and is strategizing, Spider-Man solo pushes back to Doctor Doom while everyone else is taking shelter and rest. Doctor Doom being overcome with power and is like spawning these beasts from his subconscious while he's sleeping. And all these beasts are like attacking Doctor Doom and the rest of the people on the planet. After choosing not to give up his power, the thing ultimately betrays Doctor Doom and shoots him with that same transformation gun, and then that ends the battle, and the Beyonder comes out and says that good has defeated evil. Spider-Man then asks the Beyonder what the point of all of this was, but then he is transported away back to Madame Web, and he says, your true task awaits. Now, I know this show is supposed to be one big toy commercial, but I can't help but think that this arc was a little rushed. I mean, there was one filler episode in the middle, in my opinion, but the ending just doesn't feel that like grand right so it's secret wars or like this huge comic book event that everyone knows like even the mcu is making secret wars but the ending to this just felt a little lackluster but that doesn't matter because now it's time for peak it's the moment that we've all been waiting for it's time for spider verse but in this series it's titled spider wars the last two episodes of this series start off with spider-man being transported to an alternate new york city which is in shambles this is like on fire it's being destroyed it's like a nightmare version of new york city here we see that both the green goblin and hobgoblin are working together for an evil carnage spider-man our spider-man is then taken back by madam web and is introduced to his multiverse counterparts we see all of the different Spider-Men from the Spider-Verse being introduced. Ben Riley then explains this dimension's Peter Parker is the Spider-Carnage guy that we saw earlier. This Carnage is a mix of a clone of a dead Spider-Man from Miles Warren. Here we get more exposition and see what the main mission is, to prevent Spider-Carnage from destroying the whole multiverse. After a whole lot more of exposition, we see our main Peter get sent to the Iron Peter's world, and this was like a perfect utopia of what Spider-Man could have in New York City. Everything here is perfect. Spider-Man's engaged to Gwen Stacy, he's filthy rich, and he's a celebrity. Spider Carnage then shows up out of nowhere and kidnaps Gwen after finding out that our Peter is in his universe. On a rooftop, he opens up his device and is about to suck up the whole world and destroy everything, when Peter brings out Uncle Ben from this timeline to talk some sense into Spider Carnage. After a tear jerking speech from Ben, he's able to inspire Spider Carnage to get rid of the symbiote inside of him, but the symbiote is too strong and he can't do it, to which Peter closes down the portal and jumps in at the last second, destroying himself and the symbiote. Our Peter hugs Uncle Ben and says that he will always have him in his heart, but he has to go, and he says goodbye. As we close out on the series, we see Peter get transported to our universe, where Spider-Man is his fictional character, and he meets his creator, Stan Lee. Spider-Man gives him a swing around the city and says how Stan made him into the hero he is, and he'll be forever thankful for him. Spider-Man says that for the first time in his life, he finally feels at peace, and he would not want to change a thing. I don't know, man. I get that I'm a huge Spider-Man fanboy, and that I have a YouTube channel where I've mainly only posted Spider-Man content, and it also might be due to the fact that Stanley has passed, and hearing him voice himself in this meta ending, this, this part really got to me, I'm not gonna lie. 
But as we close out on Spider-Man the Animated Series, Madam Web picks up Peter Parker and transports him away, saying that they're going off to find Mary Jane, giving Peter the happiness that he finally deserves. And that's it. That's the series. I love this show so much, and I really hope that you guys enjoyed this video. I know this is definitely going to be a longer video, so if you're sticking around this far, thank you so much for watching. I really hope you guys enjoyed. But really quickly, I just want to highlight some things that I didn't really get to show off in this video, but I really did like. I didn't really know where to put it in on the video, so I figured I would just give it its own section at the end. I didn't script any of this, so this is just my raw thoughts. Starting off with the world building, it's just so strong, and I think it's the best example of what a Spider-Man show can do. This series had 65 episodes, and over the course of those episodes, we see so much happen, and we're introduced to so many new characters. The character designs in the show were phenomenal. I love what they did with every character, except for the Vulture. I hate the young Vulture look. but. With the characters, the rogue gallery is such like a reoccurring thing in this show, and I love it. Other Spider-Man shows that I've watched, like, yeah, of course, they're gonna like break out of jail, and that's part of like Spider-Man media, but there's a real emphasis on the rogues gallery in the show, and I, I love it. One of the other things I really like is like the adult struggles that come with this version of Peter Parker. We really get to sit and watch how Peter struggles with finding love, going back from being with Felicia to MJ. He's always constantly having to choose to do the right thing, and I feel like in this version of Peter specifically, compared to other media and other like Spider-Man TV shows, I feel like this version of Peter gets it the hardest the most, and it's just something I respect. I love seeing Peter Parker in pain. I touched on this earlier with the subplot of Hydro Man, but the voice acting in this show is phenomenal. There's the iconic clip that I played earlier of Shocker, the clips of when MJ dies, but overall I don't feel like there's really a whole lot of characters that are like lacking in the voice acting department. So there you have it. That's my review and recap of Spider-Man the Animated Series. Putting this up on the tier list, I have to put this show at S tier. It's such a fundamental staple for Spider-Man fans and Spider-Man media, and to be honest, I feel like I'd be burnt at the stakes if I didn't put this anywhere else. But that's about it. Um, I really enjoyed making this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it just as much as I did. Um, gonna keep up with this series. I'm not sure what video I'll make next, but I know which show I will review if that's the next video I make. But that's gonna do it for now. When you think of Spider-Man, you probably think of this. Or this. Or maybe even this. But what you probably don't think about is the 2003 animated series that aired on MTV. <laughs> yeah, crazy, right? I've, I've never heard of this show either until starting to do research for this tier list that I'm doing. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that this is the worst Spider-Man TV show I have ever seen. Have you guys ever watched something that gave you like a physical, visceral reaction? Because that's how I felt after watching this show. I just got done watching all 13 episodes of Spider-Man the New Animated Series from 2003 that aired on MTV. And this show is so bad. So stick with me through the course of this video as I explain and I just kind of recap every horrible thing about this show and the very small, minute details of the show that I actually really enjoyed. Starting off with the things that I do not like is the art style. I'm going to give it a little bit of slack because this was 2003 and when the show was probably developed it was even earlier than that. And I get the animation at the time is trying to go for this new like edgy adult style animation and it's also called Spider-Man the New Animated Series. So it's trying something completely different to differentiate from Spider-Man the Animated Series and the Spider-Man Unlimited show as well. So I can kind of give it credit for trying something new, but just because you try something new doesn't mean it's good. You can try something new and it still be terrible. And that's what this art style for this show is. Now, another thing I wanna get into before like recapping and doing a deep dive into this show is something that isn't necessarily the show's fault in 2024, but did not help my experience at all when watching the show. So I originally watched this show, I wanna say about a year ago with my fiance at the time. And we, were, we watched the party episode, which is I think the best episode in the show, but it's still not great. And so I turned it on and you know, you get the origin story of Max Dillon becoming the Electro. And that was episode one on Disney Plus, I wanna say like mid 2023. Well, when doing research for this video or for the tier list that I'm gonna be doing, I was like, okay, what show should I watch next? And I was like, oh, I'll do the new animated series because one, I've never watched it. And it's, I also just reviewed the animated series. 
but when I went on Disney Plus, the show's no longer on there. It's not on Disney Plus anymore. So I had to find a way, I'm not gonna tell you how, I had to find a way to watch the show, right? Cause I'm not gonna pay for this show. Um, and so I found a way to watch the show and it's all out of order too. And I'm gonna put up on the screen where I found on Reddit to watch like the watch order for this show. But I'm still not completely sure that this is the right way to watch it. The way I watched it online had the same order of episodes that the Reddit post had. But then there was also so many different Reddit threads and so many different like articles that said the correct way to watch the show. One of the few things I really liked about this show was the character dynamic between Peter, MJ, and Harry. The only saving grace for this show is the fact that like the relationship building between MJ and Peter, the on again, off again, is the most interesting by far out of the entire show. That is the only thing I care about. And yeah, I'm a sucker for romance, but the Spider-Man parts of this show are so laughable. They're so bland, so uninteresting. I just, I could not keep myself from zoning out and like daydreaming when Spider-Man was on screen. But when Peter and MJ were on screen and Harry, I was actually entertained. They had like a will they won't they for 13 episodes. And Harry's this frat boy that inherited his father's company and his empire. And when I fan wrote Tom Holland's Spider-Man 4, this is what I wanted the character to be like. And I never got this inspiration from the show before because I wrote the fan writing before I watched the show. But this is like my perfect adaptation of Harry. It doesn't really touch on it a whole lot in the show, but Harry's essentially... He's not like an alcoholic, but he's constantly drinking. And I feel like if this show had more time to flesh out Harry's character, it would show him go down this alcoholic side. But he also is just like embarrassed to be part of like the heir of Norman's empire, which also to side tangent, I know I'm like rambling right now, but Norman is never brought up, never introduced. And at the end of one of the episodes, they're talking about how Harry found all these like secret files in Norman's laptop and stuff. And it's hinted that he might become something else or like, oh, there was this government this and this and this but he has never touched upon and i just it is so frustrating everything about this show i cannot like accurately put all my thoughts into how much this show annoys me so i love spider-man spider-man is my favorite superhero and if you're watching this he's probably your favorite superhero too and that being said i feel like i can find something out of every adaptation of spider-man to appreciate so my original plan for this video i was going to watch each episode and like i took notes of each episode and i was going to kind of create this narrative and spin of like going down and like breaking down each episode and the whole series as a whole because it's only one season but i'm not going to do that i'm not going to devote that much time to this terrible show first thing i don't like the voice actor Neil Patrick Harris, phenomenal actor, great guy. But all I can hear is his character from How I Met Your Mother. Single file, ladies, no fatties. Hey, Scaly, know where I can get a little tail? One thing from episode one that I really did like is it shows the direct contrast between Peter and MJ. Peter is very shy and he is always being dodgy and not upfront with his emotions, no matter who he's talking to. MJ, on the other hand, is she's an activist. She is upfront with her feelings and emotions and is always being the one that's chasing Peter. And this is very different, I feel like, from all the other adaptations of Peter and MJ. MJ is the one chasing Peter and Peter's always running away versus in other adaptations, Peter's chasing MJ, but can't commit to her because of his Spider-Man duties. Another thing that's gonna be reoccurring throughout this whole series which I was only hoping it was going to be in episode one, but sadly it wasn't, is the villains. This villain has like a Savitar suit on from The Flash, and he's like a speed guy. I feel like I'm pretty well versed in other Spider-Man rogues, but I don't know who this guy is. He was awful. I liked the music in this show, though. This isn't anything to like super applaud the show for. It's pretty standard like retro wave cyberpunk-esque music, but I like that type of music. I always put it in my videos as like background music, so I will appreciate the music in this show for that reason. The main villain in episode two is Kingpin, and we don't have a Daredevil adaptation show up in this show, but it is hinted at that this is like the Spider-Man in the Sam Raimi universe, because if they were gonna tie in the Daredevil movie with Ben Affleck, they would have had his Kingpin. And so the Kingpin model is this like really buff black guy, which is modeled from the Daredevil movie. And I think that's pretty neat. But I don't like this version of Kingpin, the fact that he has like this cane or baton that he can shoot like lasers out of. Kingpin's not supposed to really have any like gimmicks or gadgets, so I don't know why he constantly has one in this show. And he's also eating food throughout this entire episode, and there's like a, a running gag through the 20 minutes that he's this fat guy that's always eating fast food or cupcakes and stuff. But in my mind, Kingpin's always just been this brute force, like muscular guy. Yeah, he's on the heavier side, but it's not because he's like a fat slob. Overall, episode one and two aren't anything special to me. I didn't really feel that invested in Spider-Man or any of the villains and their reasoning. 
Again, the main thing I was invested in was Peter and MJ's relationship, and that it's only two episodes, but I'm confused on what's happening so far. At the end of episode one, she kisses Peter, and so I'm like, oh, okay, are they kind of just like in the beginning of their awkward relationship? Because, you know, every relationship at the beginning has like their awkward phase and stuff. But then at the end of episode two, she kisses Peter on the cheek and walks away and has a tear in her eye. And then it seemed that she's like, she's walking off with this other guy, this blonde guy that we've never seen before. And it's later on explained in like a whole nother episode just down the road that like that's one of her acting partners. But the episodes are constantly so like juggled around. I can never tell what's going on continuity wise. So going into episode three, I was giving the show the benefit of the doubt, right? Not every show is going to be perfect amongst its first three episodes, but episode three is when this show completely lost me. This is the lizard episode, and this show goes zero to 100 so quick. Now, I'm not being hyperbolic, and I'm not exaggerating that. Within the first two minutes of the episode, before the opening credits, we're introduced to Dr. Connors. We see him explain why he has one arm in like this rush sentence to Peter. He rushes Peter out of the lab, and he injects himself with lizard DNA. Again, this all happens within two minutes. No backstory, no nothing. He's like, yep, I got one arm now. And then he just straight up injects himself and we cut to black. So at the end of episode three, the lizard falls off the helicopter and he falls to the ground and the splatters on the concrete. And we see a little tear come from his eye, but it's never resolved as if like the lizard's dead or what's happening. This show is not shy to be bloody or be like gruesome and you know, be an adult theme. Heck, a character has a tramp stamp later on in this show, but at least like have a resolution with these characters. This isn't anything about the show trying to be edgy or anything. This is just poor writing. This is poor storytelling. How are we supposed to care about Spider-Man facing these villains if we don't know if they're defeated, if they died, or if Connors turns into back to Dr. Connors instead of the lizard? Nothing happens. Th this show, there's no resolution with any arc or any characters in this show, and it is so frustrating, especially being a Spider-Man fan and caring so deeply about these characters. Seeing them done poorly just it enrages me. Why are we making adaptations of characters if we do not care about the characters in general? If we want to change the story and change the direction of what these characters are going to be, that's fine if it's done properly and done in a good story. But if you're just going to change characters and then not have the story service them, what's the point? We get a, a knockoff black cat. I don't know if there's like a licensing issue and I don't care enough to look it up. Cheyenne seems to be the mix of like black cat and the prowler with her purple color scheme, but it's never touched upon. And that's something that the show does terribly. It's one of my biggest complaints with the show. There's no backstory for any of these characters. Each episode, spoiler alert, introduces a new villain and they don't show back up. They don't come back up uh, throughout the whole series. It introduces a villain, the villain gets defeated, and that's the end of the we see of them, right? And yeah, that's like very standard superhero TV show stuff, but there's no like reason or backstory for any of these characters. We don't see anything related to Spider-Man or Peter Parker's past. And I don't think that there has to be for every adaptation of Spider-Man or Peter Parker, like, oh, Uncle Ben died and this is where I got my, my powers by being bitten by a spider. We don't have to do that. We clearly see in Homecoming, Tom Holland's Spider-Man doesn't have an origin story that we see on screen. And that's fine. There's so many adaptations of Spider-Man so we can just th go into Spider-Man media without having to know his specific backstory. But at least give us little hints of what happens, especially with the characters too. Or else why are we as the audience supposed to care about these characters? One good character writing bit that I have to give this show a little praise for as well is MJ being scared to, and shy to like express her feelings to Peter. We see a scene where she's like pacing back and forth that like I'm sure we all have done like practicing your lines or what you're going to say to your crush when you ask them out. This is one of the few instances of good character traits and good character writing in the show. In the same episode in episode 6 we have these like Russian KJB people come in and start demanding like they want to see spider-man so they take hostages and all this stuff it's it's so bland that's all i can say to describe the show is that it's bland and i just don't care at all i'd rather watch peter and mj go on their movie date that they have planned but after spider-man saves the day he gets kissed by this news reporter lady that has a crush on him named indy and then mj watches that and like they don't go on their date because she thinks that Peter's cheating on her and all this stuff and this 10 second scene of Indy kissing Peter and MJ being shocked and feels like Peter's almost cheating on her made me actually feel something. This is the most emotion I felt in 6 episodes and it's not a lot and that's not good for the halfway point in this show. The fact that I have not felt almost anything while watching this show. Hopefully the back half of this series will get more interesting. So starting the back half of this series, in episode 7, Peter Parker's in science class when he meets an ADHD goth girl who's obsessed and in love with Spider-Man. 
After getting electrocuted, she developed schizophrenia where Spider-Man... <laughs> I'm sorry. She developed schizophrenia where Spider-Man is now, like, talking to her in her head, full Green Goblin style. She then tries to jump off the top of a building and unalive herself to see if Spider-Man will catch her. But at the end of the episode, the goth ADHD schizophrenic girl kidnaps MJ in order to meet Spider-Man in person, and then she's quickly defeated by Spider-Man making an elevator fall through the elevator shaft and breaking ADHD girl's neck. And that's all we see of her. Again, we never get any resolution with these characters, or the villains to be specific. It's so stupid. Episode 8, The Party, is regarded as the best episode of the series, and I don't know if I really like agree with that, but I definitely felt the most empathy and emotion in this episode. Max Dillon is the only episode in this series so far that has any depth or any character development, and I can speak for everyone when I say like I can feel the emotion and I can understand being in Max's shoes where he just wants to fit in. Max in this episode pledges to a fraternity and wants to fit in and be accepted by them, but because he's like a little weird and is an outcast, they bully him and they take him to the basement, make him do this weird fraternity ritual and shoot him with paintballs and ultimately makes him leave the party and start crying. The transformation from Max into Electro is heartbreaking, purely by the fact that he's kind of right for his reasoning, but he's ultimately wrong for the choices that he makes. I'm pretty sure that Max kills one of the guys from the fraternity that bullies him, and if Spider-Man wasn't there, I'm pretty sure he would have killed everyone. As a kid, I never really empathized or understood like the complexity of superhero villains, because like, oh, you like the hero because they do the right thing, but as an adult, like maturing and growing up, I can actually empathize and I understand with a lot more villains, but specifically this version of Max. Episode 10 introduces us to Sable and her private security team. Why we're being introduced to Sable and her security team before any, and I mean any, of Spider-Man's rogue gallery, besides Electro, is mind-boggling to me, but I felt no emotions throughout this whole episode, and this included Harry, MJ, and the news girl, Indy, getting kidnapped. There's no resolution with these characters either at the end. The, the Sable security team just kind of goes away. I was struggling to even pay attention at this point, but thankfully episode 11 introduces us back to Electro, and this is when I sat up from my seat and I started to wake up and I realized, oh, this is the first example of good writing, good storytelling. We're getting a reoccurring character. It shows us the power of reoccurring characters and villains. And then episode 11, Max comes back and he attacks his professor and tries to kill her. I'm, again, I'm not sure if she dies, but I heard like a flatlining noise after she got electrocuted, so I'm pretty sure she's dead. One thing to point out though, and I don't think this is necessarily a design, like a choice by the people that made the show, but Electro is terrifying. It's very analog horror-esque in this episode and the show in general for his design. It is so scary and I think that's like the best part of this whole series is Electro's like terrifying like static analog horror design. The plot to this episode, I kid you not, is so, like it's so Electro, it's so petty. It, Sally, the girl that was at the party that smiled at Max Dillon for 0.1 seconds before he got turned into Electro, he's in love with her and wants him to turn her into his Eve for his Electro Adam. This is insane. He injects Sally with so much electricity, I cannot imagine that Sally survives getting shocked like this. The face that she's making also is terrifying. I'll put it on screen right now. Do you think that Electro was scary in this episode? She is getting electrocuted to death by this creepy stalker man that looks like an analog horror monster come to life, and now she's being turned into his Frankenstein's monster. This is awful. I love it. One thing I forgot to talk about until looking at my notes for episode 11 is that like every few episodes, Neil Patrick Harris does voiceovers, like narrations for Peter Parker. It's so stupid. Either like do every episode have like a voiceover, but don't do like a continuity error where some episodes will do a voiceover and some episodes we won't. It's it's so stupid and hearing it like have him voice over in like a narration, it just completely took me out of the episode. Like I was so invested in this episode because Max Dillon is a freak. And then at the end, once it all gets resolved, after Sally gets burnt to a crisp, Spider-Man's like, well, that's not good as it like fades out. It's so stupid. <laughs> so here we are at the end of the series. Episode 12 and 13, part one of Mind Games. And this is the best part of the show, I'm not even gonna lie. Purely for the fact that it's the last episode. This show sucks, I can't wait for this show to be over. The two episode arc of the series finale starts with the driver of this car getting double pumped straight to the head execution style. 
So let's talk about character assassinations. Craven the Hunter is introduced in this episode, and he's reduced purely down to a man that wears like animal print and shoots a crossbow. That's it. You know, Craven the Hunter, the guy, like the huge bulking guy that like kills animals and is the best hunter on earth and wants to hunt Spider-Man because he's going to be a new challenge for him. No, 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 no. Craven the Hunter, the crossbow shooter. That's my Craven. So in episode 12, Craven kills MJ by stabbing her in the neck with a needle. And it's later on revealed that Spider-Man is like hallucinating and is still under mind control. But you want to know how much I don't care about these characters in the show? When MJ got stabbed in the neck and then she instantly dies and we see her tombstone the next scene, <laughs> I burst out laughing. It is so funny. This show is so laughably bad. And I'm forgetting to make it even worse, Stan Lee voices a character that tells Peter Parker to go kill Kraven. And it's so sad now that Stan Lee has passed away, but his character assassination of telling Peter Parker not like, there's no Uncle Ben or Aunt May in the series. So there's no like moral authority figure to tell Peter Parker like, you always need to do the right thing. With great power comes great response. But no, 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 no. Stan Lee voices this random guy at the graveyard and it's like, you should kill Kraven. So Spider-Man's like, all right, I'm gonna go kill Kraven. And then it cuts to black and then now it's time for part two of the arc. The last episode of the series starts with Spider-Man getting his get back and he hangs Kraven from his webbing. This is insane. This is the black suit Spider-Man that I wanna see. He's hanging Kraven from his webbing. That's wild. But this is something he never does, I feel like, with mind control. But you know what? This character is so far from the character of Spider-Man and Peter Parker that I know. I don't care if this version of Spider-Man's killing people. I just want to see something actually interesting. So I actually do like this fight between Kraven and like the evil mind control Spider-Man. Spider-Man was not holding back. He was like punching the ground, doing damage to the ground. Like you were, you can tell he's not holding back. But then after being defeated and Kraven's put into police custody, I mentally checked out. I was done. I, I just, I don't care at all. The villains in a Spider-Man show are arguably, if not the most important part of Spider-Man and like nailing a good Spider-Man show or media. And the villains in this are tremendously and painstakingly bland and boring. Like I said, Kraven is just reduced down to crossbow man. Sable is reduced to like this silver girl that just flirts with people and wants to hit you with her sticks. She's not threatening. All the other villains just died. I want to know if there's a reason that none of the other villains, like none of Spider-Man's big rogue gallery were not used in this show and why they were all like fake made up characters. But I just don't care. I'm not even going to look it up. I, that's how much I'm done with this show. <laughs> so then we get another fake out death where Spider-Man thinks he's killing the Wonder Twin girls. <laughs> like the girl that's like mind controlling him. But no, he pushes Indy, like the news reporter girl. He pushes her off a building. <laughs> and it's revealed that he puts her in a coma and she doesn't wake up. And this is supposed to be this like really sad like Gwen from Tasm 2 moment. But it's so funny, it's so stupid. I'm done with this show. I love Harry because his constant hatred for Spider-Man is like the one continuity in this show that's actually interesting. After finding out that Spider-Man's the one that put Indy in the coma, they're sitting there in the hospital looking at Indy's body and Harry's like, I know why this happened. Your buddy Spider-Man pushed her. <laughs> Harry is a D1 hater, dude, I love it. But the main villain in this show, the like Wonder Twin girl is defeated by Spider-Man crashing her semi-truck into a wall and she blows up and dies. There's no heroic moment like in Homecoming where Tom Holland's Spider-Man tries to save the Vulture from blowing up. There's none of that heart or anything. Spider-Man just kills his villains in this show. Why? Because we're on MTV and it's edgy, that's why. We can say sexual jokes and show our characters with tramp stamps. And this version of Spider-Man kills people. Because we're on MTV. <laughs> This warehouse scene where the Wonder Twin girl blows up feels like it's ripped straight out from Instagram Reels. This is insane. But I'll be on Instagram Reels for an hour watching, you know, people get hit by Mustangs in, uh, during takeovers. <sighs> so I talked about the voiceover a little bit and how, like, inconsistent and annoying it is. Well, this show ends on the most depressing Spider-Man ending of all time. I'm not sure if there was supposed to be a season two or if they got canned like halfway through the series, which they should have, and realized that they weren't making a season two. But this show ends with Peter giving up being Spider-Man. He has a depressing voiceover and narration 
where he's like, oh, well, I couldn't have saved Indy. This is it now. I'm going to stop being Spider-Man. And he puts his suit in a briefcase, fills it with rocks, and throws it in, like, the Hudson River or whatever. I get that Spider-Man gets depressed all the time. That's his character, right? Bad things are happening to Peter and Spider-Man. But he always gets back up. Even Andrew Spider-Man says that in No Way Home. He's like, I got rageful. I stopped pulling my punches. I got bitter. But then he realizes that that's wrong. He, I would imagine this version of Spider-Man from the Tazam universe. I don't even have to imagine. It's shown in No Way Home. He becomes Spider-Man again after giving up Spider-Man. Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man in Spider-Man 2 comes to the realization that the world is better with Spider-Man. But no, this Spider-Man just gives up being Spider-Man, and that's the end of the series. MJ gets rejected, all of the characters are depressed, Harry has zero resolution to any of his character arcs, he never learns that Peter is Spider-Man, he never learns that Spider-Man's trying to do the right thing, he never gets any resolution, and then Indy is in a coma that she will never wake up from. The doctors even say it. This show ends in like the most depressing and bleak ending possible for Spider-Man media. I wish this show would have got it. No, I don't. I don't wish this show got a season two. I'm, I wish this show was never invented. This show is horrible. Between the sexual undertones constantly being thrown around in this show, for no reason other than the fact that it's like a millennial zany haha sexual undertone show, and the fact that none of these characters are interesting, all the villains die, I was falling asleep throughout this show, the one thing I wanted was Harry, this alcoholic friend of Peter, to become evil and just destroy Spider-Man and beat him to a bloody- No, 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 nothing like that happened. This show is so painstakingly boring and uninteresting. F tier. This show is terrible. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, a little different than my past videos. It's more of like a rant because this show is awful. Um, I'm probably going to do like Spectacular Spider-Man or Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends next. Something that like is a good palate cleanser that I actually enjoy. Uh, this show is awful. Don't watch it. If you do watch it and you hate it, don't come to me. I told you not to watch it. Um, but yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the video. A little different video than the past. Um, throwing this on the rating, obviously it's an F tier. Um, hopefully the media and like content I watch in the future is better. Spider-Man the Animated Series is one of the most iconic, if not the most iconic adaptation of Spider-Man in the animated realm. The animated series was my childhood and it fills me with so much nostalgia every time I see it on screen. But did you know that this show actually had a sequel that feels like it was lost to time? That's right, I'm talking about Spider-Man Unlimited, and I hardly see anyone talk about this show or the series as a whole, and now I know why. Before you diehard Spider-Man fans start writing in the comments, I actually know that this is not a sequel to the animated series. I know, I know, I just wanted to see who I could farm engagement with. But this show was actually created purely for the contractual obligations to continue airing episodes of the animated series. The plan at the time was to create a very low-budget Spider-Man show so that Fox Kids could keep the rights to the animated series and keep producing an unlimited amount of episodes. And this partly explains why the animated series has 65 episodes, which is almost unheard of for a kid's cartoon at the time. So then if Spider-Man Unlimited is technically a predecessor to the animated series, and the animated series is amazing, then why is Spider-Man Unlimited never talked about? Well, due to contractual obligations that dealt with the animated series and this small low-budget indie film that was going to be coming out in 2002 called Spider-Man, the 1999 Unlimited series could not feature any typical Spider-Man characters. This show was unable to use any of the early comics or even the classic Spider-Man costume. The series would be able to use Spider-Man or Peter Parker, but none of his supporting characters or side stories. And then this ultimately resulted in the producers and writers wanting to create a 2099 Spider-Man show, but after Batman Beyond was a, such a huge success at the time, they feared that people would think that they were just copying their biggest competitor, DC. And even though Spider-Man 2099 and Miguel Harris is his own character, it's not that known to the public, so they thought that a lot of people wouldn't think this is an original character, but just a ripoff of Batman Beyond. This ultimately culminated in Spider-Man hitching a ride to Counter-Earth, and the original idea was that Spider-Man would find Uncle Ben on this Earth and want to stay here, but this idea was shortly shut down because of the Clone Saga mess. Executives thought that the idea of having a different Peter Parker and a different Uncle Ben on the same Earth is too close to the Clone Saga mess, so they scrapped that idea completely. The show then got greenlit into production without a core story being established, which resulted in a weird love child between Spider-Man the Animated Series, Spider-Man 2099, and Batman Beyond which resulted in what I can only describe as a grunge, retro-futuristic-esque Spider-Man TV show. So if you're new to the channel, then you should know that I've been watching and ranking every Spider-Man animated TV show, and I've always seen the art style and the suit specifically for Spider-Man Unlimited, and I always wanted to watch it, but I never really got around to it. So when it was time to sit down and actually watch this show for the first time, I was ecstatic, and honestly, I was pleasantly surprised after watching the first episode. 
I even put a little community post on my YouTube channel saying how much I really enjoyed the first episode and I was really excited to see where the story goes from there. And a lot of you guys said you liked the show as well and then some of you guys said it was mid. So I was really excited to see where this series was gonna go. But sadly, to my disappointment, the first episode is by far the best episode in the series. The story follows the events of John Jameson Jr. exploring Counter-Earth, which is like a planet on the other side of the sun that's supposed to mimic our Earth. As Spider-Man witnesses Venom and Carnage teaming up for some reason to hitch a ride on JJ's shuttle, Spider-Man decides it's up to him to save JJ and go to Counter-Earth. So Peter creates one of my favorite Spider-Man suits of all time and convinces Nick Fury in this universe to let him take his shuttle to Counter-Earth and go save JJ. I like the in-universe explanation that since, you know, Spider-Man's gonna be in outer space, he needs a more, like, technologically advanced suit, so now he has this cool suit with the cape, and honestly, I love the design of this suit so much. I'm not a huge fan of the overall tech-based advanced Spider-Man suits, uh, like the Iron Spider, unless it's for, like, a specific event, but there's a good in-universe explanation for why he has this suit. He says that he's been working with Reed Richards for the past six months to create this, like, nanotech suit, and I think it's a good in-universe explanation for why he needs to have this tech-based suit in outer space. Space, so I'll let it slide. So going into this, I had no idea where this show was going to go narratively with a whole new counter-earth and stuff. I think this concept is very unique and different, but like I said in my review of Spider-Man the new animated series, just because something is different or unique doesn't mean that it's good. Once we get to counter-earth, we see that this world is ran by bestials, which are like an animal-human hybrid made by the high evolutionary. If you saw Guardians of the Galaxy 3 last year, then just think of the planet with all like the animal people on it, and that's basically what's going around on counter-earth. These animal hybrid bestials are like the ruling class, and the humans are the poor homeless people that are like the secondary class citizens that are like living in the slums on counter-earth. And I really like this drastic contrast between earth and counter-earth because it makes counter-earth feel like a whole new planet rather than just a new city. And that's one of my new gripes with new Star Wars projects, not to get off on a whole new tangent, but new planets just feel like new cities, but Counter-Earth feels like its own planet. At least it did for the first few episodes, but after that it felt like Counter-Earth was more just like a 2099 New York City with a lot of animal people. There wasn't a whole lot of world building, but we'll get to that at the end of the video. Once Spider-Man meets back up with JJ, he learns that there's a group of human resistance fighters who are trying to take back their planet from the bestials and the high evolutionary. JJ tells Spider-Man that the High Evolutionary has their shuttles and that they can't go back to their own Earth without having to defeat the High Evolutionary and getting their shuttles back. This is a very simple plot and honestly I'm on board. We gotta get back to our Earth number one, but we can't do that because we don't have our rocket ship and we have to defeat the big bad guy in the series in order to get the rocket ship. Plain and simple, stakes are laid out right in front of us. Over the show's 13 episodes, Spider-Man teams up with the human resistance fighters to take down counter-earthed versions of like the Sentinels from X-Men, and in this earthed version of Spider-Man's rogues gallery. He also meets brand new characters, including a mother and son named Miyoko and Shane, who he ends up living with in the meantime. And then there's a small subplot of him working for the Daily Bite, which is like the off-brand Daily Bugle, and then there's another mean like head news guy, which is like a blatant ripoff of J. Jonah Jameson. But sprinkled in between the main plot of the 13 episodes is the Venom and Carnage B plot of the show, where they're working together for some reason to turn all the bestials and humans into these symbiotes and eventually take over the whole planet, but I'll talk more about that later. Now that I've done the groundwork and laid out the overall sense of the story and narrative, let's talk about the things that I liked about the show, and honestly, there's a lot. I touched upon this earlier, but I absolutely love this suit. Everything from the old comic style red and black colors to the retro futuristic design of the suit to the ripped web cape, which in all honesty provides zero practicality to the suit, but it looks so hard, it's so good, I love it. My only complaint is that I wish the suit had some sort of webbed wings, whether he could turn them on or off, but imagine the webbed wings with the webbed cape, that would be insane. That combo would go so hard. And here's some trivia for Spider-Man fans. The original design for Spider-Man's costume was black and red, but the artist had to shade in the black with blue so that the colors would pop properly out on the white pages. So eventually it was thought that Spider-Man's colors were blue and red when it was originally supposed to be black and red. So getting to see like my favorite aesthetic of like, the futuristic cyberpunk aesthetic with the black and red original colors is so good. Everything in this show from the art style to the cell shading is phenomenal. I love it. Now I'm going to keep glazing the suit for a little bit because the sound design when Peter uses his web shooters is so cool. I love it. I'm the pop. Got it. it makes the suit really feel grounded in that Peter has to be cautious about each one of the webs he shoots. It feels like there's a direct purpose each time he uses a web. For like a lack of better term, they feel very gooey and sticky. And yeah, you might be thinking like, yeah, obviously Spider-Man's webs are gooey and sticky, but in other adaptations for some reasons, the webs in those shows really 
they kind of just feel like ropes. I can't really describe it. Whereas in this show, each time Spider-Man shoots someone with his webs, it looks like he took a bottle of glue and just squirted it all over someone. Oh, and Spider-Man uses his web shooters to shoot out what I can only call our pellets. And each time he shoots it, coupled with like the sound design and the animation, it looks like he has dual A12s with the switch, just each time he's shooting it at somebody. Okay, you've seen one AA12. Now you're going to get to see two AA12s. Now I just want to rapid fire a few more things that I think this show does great. Starting with like the music and sound design overall in this show is phenomenal. I, I absolutely adore it. Each voice actor also does an amazing job, especially the voice actor for Peter and Spider-Man. He also actually voice acts for the Green Goblin in this show and other video game adaptations that will come later on in the early 2000s. He voices Spider-Man and Peter in that as well. I love the relationship between Spider-Man and Shane. I just love when Spider-Man is like with little kids and is just a perfect role model in general to them. You can tell how much Shane looks up to both Peter and Spider-Man because he doesn't know they're the same person. Another thing, I feel like the human resistance fighters, each of them feel like their own different character, which is something I feel like we don't get a lot in different adaptations with side characters. They're kind of all just given like very surface level dialogue. So in this show, a lot of the side characters actually get their own episode dedicated to them, which I think is pretty cool. One episode that I really liked is we get a sad backstory of what happened to JJ when he lands on Counter-Earth. He gets experimented by the High Evolutionary and is now a werewolf. And it's a cool plot detail that I feel like a lot of Spider-Man adaptations don't get to explore. But to my head canon and almost everything I know about the character, JJ normally is a werewolf. Just other Spider-Man adaptations don't ever get that far down into the story to have him be a werewolf. So it was good getting to see that here in season one of the show early on, even though it is on a Counter-Earth and he gets his powers for a different reason. Now, the last thing I really want to take time and applaud this show for is the art style. From everything to the animation, to the comic book text paneling, to the character designs, except for Venom and Carnage's character designs, those are terrible, but I'll talk about that later. I absolutely love the cyberpunk city and each character and building having these like really bright, vibrant colors. I can't stress how much everything in this show looks so beautiful, it looks so good. This is some of the best Spider-Man art style I've ever seen. I'll always be a nostalgic fanboy for the animated series, but I've got to admit, I think the art style and the color shading specifically in this show is leagues ahead of the animated series. I love Peter's character design. He looks more modern and less like geeky and nerdy than he has in past adaptations. And I know that's part of his character, but the Amazing Spider-Man movies kind of showed like he can still be a geeky looking guy, but he can also still be hot. So I like Peter's character design in this show. The High Evolutionary also has a really great character design. He's like a brooding force of nature with like this tarantula trench coat around him. I think he looks great. Um, honestly, all of the characters feel really unique and feel great. Even the weird like horny bestial lady, like all the character designs, they just look so good. The next big standout for me in the show by far has to be like the text comic book paneling. I don't know if this has been done in other superhero TV shows before, but this is genius. It's such a small thing, but it gets the job done and it helps the audience understand narratively where we're at. When I first saw this paneling, I felt like a little kid. I was so giddy and filled with joy. It's such a small thing, but I think it shows a clear direction and intention with the story and where we're going at. And I don't think a lot of other adaptations have ever done this. Obviously, this is a TV show about a comic book character. So making the TV show feel more like a comic book come to life seems like a no brainer to me. I don't know why other adaptations don't ever do this. From all the concept art that I've seen from Marvel's The Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man, which is this uh, animated TV show that's coming out, I think in 2024 or 2025, and it's supposed to be like a non-canon prequel to Tom Holland's Spider-Man, but from everything I've seen about like the art style to the character designs, it just looks like an older like retro comic book. And I'm super excited to see the direction that the show ends up taking, but the paneling seems like something that would fit right in with the art style of that show as well. So I hope that's something that gets transferred over to that show. As much as I like all the things in this show, there is a fair bit of things that I didn't like. So let's just get into my main gripes and negatives that I had with Spider-Man Unlimited. Now, if you've already seen this show or you're just familiar and have seen videos or clips of this show, then you already know what I'm gonna talk about first. And that's gonna be the abominational character design of Carnage and Venom. Carnage specifically is this very skinny, grotesque, like bony symbiote. It's so gross and disgusting. The Venom design isn't as bad. I just don't know where they're going with like the horns and the bones that keep poking out of them. It doesn't make any sense. But multiple times throughout the series, Venom and Carnage like reduce down into this like goop version of themselves, which my main question when watching this was like, where are Cletus Cassidy and Eddie Brock at in that? It doesn't make sense that they're like 
constricting their bones and like slumming them down and then they're almost like octopi in the sense that they can move and go in between holes and like panels and stuff it's so weird i hate it they also speak in the singular instead of the plural so like venom normally speaks like we are venom talking about like venom and eddie but in this they both speak in the singular saying like i want this i want that which it's unlike their characters and it's just very confusing but it was over too soon I can't wait till we spread more spores! What the hell are you? We are Venom. I will say there's one episode specifically of Venom and Eddie getting separated. We get to see this version of the black suit Spider-Man, which I think is pretty cool. And we do get a good arc of Eddie basically dying and realizing that he has no control when the symbiote's over him, but he wants to live, so he's going to accept that the symbiote will come back onto him. Another thing I'm not a fan of with this show is I think there was a huge missed opportunity to not have Spider-Man fight all of his rogue galleries. Because if you think about it, his rogue gallery is predominantly based on villains that have their theme based around like animals. So like the Green Goblin, that's a little different. But you have like Rhino, Scorpion, Doc Ock, Vulture. There's a whole lot of Spider-Man villains that are based off different animals. Yet all of those villains that I just mentioned are not in the show, which I think is a huge missed opportunity because we're dealing with like these animal bestial hybrids. We do see a version of Kraven, which is essentially just Kraven with a like ponytail. We do see Electro, which is, he looks like the guy, I think his name's Sid from Monsters Inc. He's like an electric eel. That's a terrible, disgusting design. Um, we get a vulture design, which just kind of looks like a human dressed up like a vulture, which is really weird. So that one doesn't make any sense either. And then the Green Goblin design that we do see looks like this very like skinny, bony, kind of like the Carnage design version of like the Joker. And he's more of an anti-hero. I just think like the overall villains in this show were a huge missed opportunity. Speaking of missed opportunity, you really don't have to watch all of this show to get a full grasp of what it is. A large majority of the middle episodes in the show are just filler and you don't need to watch it. Like I'm not interested in seeing the plot, origin story, and backstory of Bandage Man that doesn't talk and is like wearing sandals the entire time. I just you don't need to watch that. It's not that important. Speaking of the filler plot, a lot of it, it wasn't complicated, it just never felt like it was going anywhere. I constantly found myself asking like what's next what's going on because like the main way a lot of superhero tv shows go is like you villain of the week right you have certain things you have to do to advance the plot of the story but what it felt like constantly when watching this show is a good chunk of those middle episodes between like when spider-man arrives on counter earth to when like the big battle happens at the end of the series a lot of the middle chunk of the series just felt like there wasn't a lot going on like there's gonna be a very small problem we're gonna fight these sentinels and then we're gonna move on and i yeah i get i'm being critical of a show from 1999 based on spider-man but it just it was kind of lame it was not that interesting and it was so disappointing getting to see what like this show actually was about and this great concept of spider-man going to a counter earth with these beast jewels and the high evolutionary like it had so much potential I just did not enjoy myself watching the show. I feel like this could have been condensed down to like a six episode miniseries and then have him get back to regular Earth and have some plot with Venom and Carnage being like more advanced symbiotes or something. I don't even know. I just don't think this show needed and really justified having 13 episodes on Counter Earth. I'd say it probably needed about six. The plot was very weak and lackluster. The biggest sin this show commits is just being forgettable. When the show is good, it's great, but I think it just drug on too long. And the fact that the series ends just after one season and it's on a cliffhanger, which there's like this hive mine, part of the B-plot with Carnage and Venom, is there's this hive mine on the planet that's like calling them as symbiotes. And so they're gonna try and like do some, some symbiote stuff, right? To make all the bestials and all the humans on the planet symbiotes. So that's the B-plot of the series. And at the very end of the last episode, like in the finale, the bad guys aren't defeated. They kind of like go their separate ways because they break out Venom and Carnage, like Cletus Cassidy and Eddie Brock, because they got separated from their symbiotes. And they kind of reveal like, hey, we're screwed. There's this hive mind. And since Eddie Brock was separated from the symbiote once in the series, he made a fail safe that if he ever gets separated again, the hive mind's gonna like explode and have the symbiotes go all over the whole planet. So that's how the series ends. I'm not even kidding. I get that it was a season one, and they obviously had plans, I would think, for a season two. 
but season two never got made because Pokemon was so, it was such a big hit in the 90s. Like everyone knows about Pokemon, right? But because it was such a big hit, Marvel specifically kind of pulled all their comic book projects at the time and wanted to focus their efforts elsewhere. This also culminated with like the Spider-Man movie that came out in 2002. So the writers for the show, they had not written a season two yet. Um, and if they did, there was not a lot planned out yet. So the fact that the show ended on a cliffhanger and one where everyone presumably dies, it's just, it's not a good look for the series. I know I said I had a whole lot to talk about this show that I wasn't a fan of, but I really don't now that I think about it. And it's just not as interesting as other adaptations of Spider-Man. Don't get me wrong. I love Spider-Man. I love a good Spider-Man TV show. And I will take a show like this, especially with the high highs that this show has over the abomination that is the new animated series. So I do think this show is leagues above the animated series or the new animated series, I should say. But the biggest gripe with the show is that it's very boring at times. And that's the worst thing a Spider-Man show could do in my mind. So yeah, I don't really have a whole lot else to say about this show in terms of what I didn't like about it. I just think the overall plot of Spider-Man going to a different planet where he could fight different versions of his rogue gallery and he has this new like Batman Beyond 2099-esque suit. I love that. I think that's awesome. You get hit like a fish out of water story with like this character that everyone knows. There's so many different adaptations of him. It's like, what is he gonna do when he's not in New York City? But it's very lackluster, the way that this show ended up being, and that's the worst part about this show. I just can't help but think that this show just had so much potential, and ultimately they just wasted it. There's not a lot that came from the show that I wanna look back and be like, man, that was such a good, a good episode, or a good plot, or a good series. The only thing I really like about this show is the animation style, how vibrant everything looks, and then the most beautiful suit that I've seen. Other than that, I just can't help but think of all the wasted potential. So I would recommend checking out the series if you haven't watched it. I would say start with the first episode, and if you like that, then keep watching it. And if it doesn't really interest you and you just want to see cool visuals, then throw it on in the background while like you're scrolling through TikTok or something, or you're watching some of my videos, or you know, you're like making dinner, folding laundry, or just cleaning the house, or honestly doing whatever. Put it on in the background, and then you catch a few awesome moments of the show, then you'll like it. But I don't think you need to sit down and watch all 13 episodes. A good chunk of the majority of the show is just filler and boring. But Plugging it into the tier list, I have to say, like, I'm gonna give it a C tier. I think it's leagues better and above the new animated series, but I do not think it's better than the Ultimate Spider-Man. So I'm borderline between C and D tier, but because of the high highs of the show, I think I'm gonna put it at C tier. Looking back at the overall show, it's sad to think about that we might not get such a unique adaptation of Spider-Man ever again. I mean, you think of the adaptations that have come since the 2002 Sam Raimi movie, they're all very like close and grounded to the traditional Spider-Man story. And yeah, there's comics that are different and there's like Miguel, the 2099 and stuff. But speaking about Peter Parker specifically, every mainstream adaptation that Marvel has put out is very close to the grounded, like generic story that we know Spider-Man to stay in. So I would love to see a continuation of this series in the future. I know X-Men 97 is getting revived soon and way before Spider-Man Unlimited like revival, I wanna see a Spider-Man animated series revival. So if this show ever does get a season two, then I'll be here to watch it day one. But until then, you can check this out if you want to. If not, you're not missing any groundbreaking Peter Parker or Spider-Man stories. I just watched both seasons of The Spectacular Spider-Man and I have so much to say. But first off, before we get into the video, I just want to put a little disclaimer up here that like, I'm obviously not the first person to ever review this series. I definitely won't be the last person. So stuff you hear me say, you probably heard before or other people might have said in the past. So I don't know if anything I'm going to say is necessarily going to be considered like groundbreaking or extreme nuanced takes on the show, but I do want to give my individual perspective and history with this show. So stick around if you're here for that. I'm also going to rank it on the tier list that I've been doing. Start off with my my history for the show and like where I was at like going into this is I originally watched Spectacular Spider-Man I want to say about a year ago or two years like for the first time and like I know for like a Spider-Man fan like why have I not seen the Spectacular Spider-Man and like I was told like online and like I saw on discourse and stuff that like there's a bunch of hype behind this show and it's considered to be like the best Spider-Man animated series and I gotta say, like, spoiler alert for the tier list, I agree. The short two seasons that this show has is by far some of the best Spider-Man media we're ever gonna get. 
And so to say that like putting this anywhere on the tier list, I'm just gonna go ahead and put it on right now, like spoiler alert for the rest of the video, but like this is an S tier. This is this show is phenomenal. So let's just get that out of the way right now. No thoughts on where this is going. We're throwing it straight to the top. So back to my history with this show, I didn't watch this show when it first came out, like the Ultimate Spider-Man or the 90s Spider-Man when I was like a little, little kid watching the show. So I didn't really understand the hype and everything. I was kind of burned out around Spider-Man whenever the show originally came out. And so I went on a trip to Washington DC and it was like a 15 hour plus car ride Ride. and it was right when the show got put on Netflix so I knew like I had nothing better to do besides just sit there and watch all 26 episodes of the show and this again was about I think it was in 2021 so it was about a little over like two years ago and I fell in love with the show within the first episode I was a little hesitant going back to like revisiting everything from Peter Parker like back in high school because we've seen that so many times and everyone besides like the new comic that just came out puts Peter Parker in high school or college. I prefer him like getting his powers like senior year, get like one, one maybe two years of Peter in high school and then throw him into college where he can like have more mature relationships and stuff. But that being said, I fell in love with the show. And so one of the big takeaways I have now after watching the show for a second time all two seasons is like I really enjoy that everything is done by the books. There's so many nuanced takes and different perspectives that we get with Spider-Man and media nowadays because there's so many different adaptations, right? I just reviewed Spider-Man Unlimited and that's a crazy interpretation of Peter Parker and like the whole Spider-Man character. So take the Homecoming trilogy for example. If you ask everyone, like Harry Osborn is supposed to be Peter Parker's best friend, but in that trilogy, it's Ned Leeds or The Amazing Spider-Man, the two movies that you get. Harry isn't introduced until the second movie and he instantly becomes like evil, right? So we didn't get to spend a whole lot of time with those characters in like the popular movie versions that we've got. So going into Spectacular Spider-Man and seeing everything laid out right in front of us early on by the books is a very nice fresh of breath air. We see Flash Thompson, Liz Allen, MJ, Gwen, Peter, of course, you get old Aunt May, Uncle Ben's already killed off. We don't have to see his origin story until it's in a version of a flashback later on in the series. Uh, did I say it? we get Harry, we get Norman, we get Doc Ock, Dr. Connors, all of our characters were thrown in and introduced to right at the very beginning of the series. That way, as the series goes on, we can move and evolve with these characters and see their motives and their relationships and everything they're going through evolve over time rather than like what happened in Spider-Man 3, for example. Eddie Brock's introduced and like comic book fans and Spider-Man fans know, okay, nine times out of 10, Eddie Brock is gonna be Venom. So when Eddie Brock is introduced into a story, we know he's gonna be Venom. Like it's, it kinda, you just know where the story's gonna go. But in this version, like yeah, Eddie Brock is Venom, but we get to see these characters evolve over time. Dr. Kirk Connors is the lizard, for example, in episode three of season one, but we know where he's going, so that's not necessarily a surprise, but characters like Norman Osborn, who like, spoiler alert for the whole series, is the main big bad as the Green Goblin, and at the end of season one, or like in the early on in season one, and at the end of season two, there's like this chameleon arc where we don't know if Harry or Norman is the Green Goblin, and it's this really nice take on the characters, but we get to see people like Doc Ock, Rhino, the Enforcers, all, and I mean like almost all besides the big wheel of spider-man's rogues gallery get their origin stories and we see them move on and we see their motivation characters like tombstone and sandman they're not necessarily like yeah they're bad guys but you see little small moments where peter is like bonding with them and they agree to disagree on a lot of stuff and i feel like we don't see like the evolution of these characters in other spider-man media it's like all right we're introduced to a bad guy boom he's evil now there's no like black and white difference between any of that. And that's one thing I feel like this show did really well. Like Doc Ock, for example, early on, he's introduced as just a scientist, but we see over the course of the show, how he evolves and his reasoning for why he becomes evil. And then towards the end of the series, he's just like a, a blatant maniac, which is like the Doc Ock we love, right? But we don't see that happen all at once. It happens over time. And I think that's the best way to do these characters because from my perspective and like my opinion as like, a big Spider-Man fan, right? The best way to do Spider-Man media and Spider-Man villains are to make those villains impact Peter in a personal way. So yes, he has to defeat the bad guys to like stop killing the civilians or whatever they want to do. Like that's the hero aspect. But the part that makes it more impactful as a reader and as an audience is the fact that these villains have a personal stake with Peter Parker and Spider-Man. So Spider-Man has to go out of his way to like do the right thing, but to also make sure like his personal life isn't at stake and i feel like a lot of adaptations in recent past have not come down that route so it was very good to see that perspective with like norman osborne and harry and the different villains that you get in this series 
But speaking of villains done correctly, I don't know if, like where, I haven't seen a lot of discourse. I wanted to not look at like Spider-Man Reddit or anything revolving the spectacular Spider-Man while watching this again for the second time because I wanted to form my own opinion. So I don't know if this arc is considered to be like the best arc of the whole series or whatever, but in my opinion, the Venom arc was my favorite out of all the arcs in the show. I think the Venom one stood out the most. and. If I were to write my own Spider-Man like TV show, I would put Venom in probably season two or season three. I would introduce him later on after we see characters like Eddie Brock and Peter Parker like evolve their relationship. Not Spider-Man and Venom, but Eddie Brock and Peter. How you get enough time with those characters where like you see their friendship, like they're called bros in the show, but you'll like you'll see their friendship, but then you'll also see them become enemies, and then Peter gets the black suit and then Eddie Brock becomes Venom. You get all of that over the course of like a few seasons. That way when Venom finally comes, it's very impactful. I feel like this show kind of speed ran that route, but again, like if you're gonna make a Spider-Man TV show, you're gonna throw Venom in there, so I don't necessarily blame them, like the showrunners, for putting Venom in early on. That being said, I do think this is the best arc in the show. And one of the things that I like the most out of this is you see the effects of Peter having the black suit, not only fighting like his like verbally with his friends and family, you see the effects that that has on the villains he's fighting. Like there's one scene in particular, which might be the best scene in the whole show, where Peter like falls asleep and says like, man, I wish I like could defeat these villains, but I'm so tired or whatever. And then the symbiote essentially sleepwalks for him and fights the villains while he's sleeping. And you see the way that Peter's fighting these villains is not how Peter normally fights. Like he tries to rip like the vulture's head off, but he has like a reinforced plate on the back of his head So the vulture doesn't die. That's something that our Peter would never do Or he has this like really fast like spin roundhouse kick right on Doc Ock and then takes the tentacles And is gonna like shove it in his face, but Captain Stacy has to stop Peter There's a whole lot of other instances in this fight with the Sinister Six of doing stuff that Peter would never do but the fact that it's the black symbiote he's doing it instead and I just think that's extremely impactful we also see when Peter has the black suit on how it affects his relationships with others and Flash Thompson out of all characters is the one to like reach out to Peter essentially and is like hey man you're treating us bad sorry that like we're the only people that care about you and we want you to like be well I could talk for hours about the relationship between Peter and Flash in other media, but that's one of my favorite relationships like out of Spider-Man and his friends is Peter and Flash because the way I've always seen it is Flash isn't this like brooding bad guy villain that like or bully that's like here to kill Peter. He's just someone that's always been like he's like rough with him, looks at him as like a little brother and is envious and kind of jealous of how smart Peter is, but it does bully him. Like he's not shy from bullying him. I think the adaptation in the Amazing Spider-Man movies get this done really well, where Flash isn't this like mustaching twirling villain. He's just like, he's kind of a douche, kind of a jerk to Peter, but at the end of the day, like when Peter's uncle dies, Flash goes up to him and is like, I'm sorry, man. Or like when Peter in this show gets his symbiote off him and is like normal, Peter goes up to him and is like, hey, thanks for talking some sense into me. And he kind of like gives him a fist bump or whatever and is like, don't mention it, man. But then immediately right after that, like the football guys come up and Flash is like, get away from me, puny Parker. Like he doesn't want to be known that he has a soft spot, but and that's just one of my favorite things about like the Flash Peter dynamic, and I think this show does a phenomenal job with that, like in general, just branching out and fleshing out these characters as a whole. I'm almost done with my little tangent about the Venom arc, but getting to see Peter like fight the Sinister Six, uh, and then you see Peter scrambling almost like um, like the Spider-Man One route of like, do you have to save MJ or do you want to save like the bus or like the cart full of little kids? Venom knows that Peter Parker is Spider-Man, so he's tormenting, like he sends flowers to Aunt May, he goes and tries to kill Gwen, which they blue ball us with like a, the, the death of Gwen Stacy, like she falls from like the little inflatable thing and Spider-Man catches her. But the sequence at the end of the arc, getting to see like Spider-Man dodging or like going left and right, trying to figure out what's Venom gonna do, like he knows who I love. Is he gonna hurt MJ? Is he gonna hurt my friends? Is he gonna like kidnap Gwen, which he does? Is he gonna hurt Aunt May? Like he knows where Peter lives, he knows all of that. So getting to see Peter getting like tormented and like having to choose to go like left and right to see where Flash is gonna attack or where Eddie's gonna f attack, I don't know, I really enjoyed that. And so the idea to show Spider-Man's origin story in like a mental flashback while he's overcoming the symbiote inside his mind at the end of season one, that's awesome, dude. I couldn't think of that like myself to do that as like a creative decision, but that's awesome. Getting to see, because a lot of adaptations like 
you just you'll get your Spider-Man origin story, or you won't. Like you'll get it early on, or you'll get like one throwaway line, like kind of what happened in Homecoming, essentially. Like, oh yeah, I got bit by a spider, or whatever. But in this, like, you get to see Spider-Man working in action, and he's not perfect. It's year one Spider-Man, so he's making mistakes, right? But you get to see, like, okay, this guy kind of knows what's up. This is Spider-Man. He's adjusted, used to everything. Let's go. Let's roll with it. And then like you get the origin at the end of season one in the big finale, which is ultimately what stops Spider-Man from becoming evil. And like Venom and Uncle Ben are essentially like the angel and devils on Peter's shoulders inside his mind. It's such a cool concept. Again, this probably isn't anything new for people that have been fans of the show. But for me, like being an adult watching this, like watching a kid's cartoon, getting these like impactful messages and stuff i don't know i thought it was pretty cool not again not something completely groundbreaking in like spider-man media but this is probably one of the best adaptations of spider-man i've seen in general period quick little things about the show that i really liked are like the character designs i think ultimate spider-man still has some of the best character designs for the animated realm that i've seen but the design choices especially for the villains in this are very unique and interesting like i really like the one that like sticks out the most to me is max dylan's electro where he has like the tubes on his face and like he gets like the little pointy stars and like the way he throws lightning i don't really know how to describe it i'm not an animator i'm just someone that likes watching <laughs> cartoons but like the character designs in the show were really interesting and another thing that i like about spider-man is he's like five six in this show he's like really really small and when you eventually see him in across the spider-verse in the crossover he is so small and you see this early on in this series in like season one when he fights rhino for the first time he is like crawling all over rhino and rhino being this like brooding force he can't hit him and i think that just speaks to the fact that like spider-man isn't supposed to be this like big guy yeah he's supposed to be lanky and stuff but in like the comics that i've read Spider-Man has always been this, like, compact, smaller guy that is, like, super nimble and small and quick and stuff, right? So he's super hard to get a hold of. That coupled with his quips, he's just so annoying. He'd be the worst, like, superhero to fight. The quips, though, like, Spider-Man in the show is funny. Like, genuinely funny. Some of the bits are kind of, like, slapstick where, like, we're laughing at Spider-Man getting hit by stuff. But Spider-Man in the show is funny. What do you think? I'm stupid? Well, you are dressed stupid. You always wherever I'm doing a job. What do you got? Some kind of spider sense or oh, something? That's funny you should say that. Oh. But yeah, I could talk for for like hours about this show. Um just after recently watching it it's one of the best adaptations i've seen of the character and josh keaton does a phenomenal job i know he's on youtube it'd be cool if you watch this he's not probably not gonna watch this definitely won't watch it um but josh keaton does a phenomenal job i saw that there's rumors of josh keaton showing up in invincible season two as this version of spider-man i like invincible i like spider-man a whole lot more so i'll be super excited if spectacular shows up in invincible that that'd be awesome but I know like the future for the show was eventually to do a movie and I think they were gonna go to five or six seasons and that's a shame that that didn't happen. Um, like I know there's like a petition for Spectacular Spider-Man to get the movie and the other seasons and stuff and that'd be great, I'm all here for that. But there's something about a charm to this show, not being a mini series because there's 26 episodes and like the 90s animated series has like 65 and the Ultimate Spider-Man or no, Spider-Man Unlimited and the new animated series, they only have like one season each. So this isn't like a mini series, but there's something of the charm to the fact that there's only two seasons because with the 2017 Spider-Man show that I haven't watched, but I'll review next or review soon, that has like five seasons. Um, Ultimate Spider-Man has a lot as well, but there's something of a charm of a show that is so good, that is so short. A lot of shows and a lot of like Spider-Man media feels like they drag on. A lot of shows will go into like The Office. They'll go until they're burnt out and no one's really watching it anymore. But this show, it's like, it's short, compact and to the point in every episode. You can just put it on in the background or not in the background. You just put it on and watch it. Like this show, Every episode is a banger. Every show, every episode of this, every part of this series is a hit. Um, nothing groundbreaking. If you're watching this, you know that Spectacular Spider-Man's good. So it's nothing groundbreaking. But there's something to the charm of two seasons only, 26 episodes, all of them being complete bangers. Um, and that's it. The show's just compact. It's those individual episodes that there's nothing, there's not a lot of flaws I can think of. The only thing I could think of in this show that I wasn't a fan of would just be like the rushed arc on Venom, but it doesn't feel rushed. I just am not a fan of having Venom be the main bad guy so soon, but it works. So not a whole lot I can say about this show that I don't like. Um, that's really about all I have. I know I've been like rambling and stuff. I didn't script this video either. Um, throwing this on the tier list again, like I said at the beginning of the video, this is an S tier, S plus if I would. Spider
Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Do you guys have a piece of media, whether that be like a book or a TV series or even a movie that you were huge fans of when you were younger, but then as you got older and became an adult, you kind of just looked back on it and realized yeah, this isn't as good as I remembered it to be. Well, one time when I was in high school, me and my best friend were watching Star Wars, and we were like, hey, let's throw on Attack of the Clones. And about 20 minutes into it, we just kind of looked at each other, and we both realized, like, we have no idea what this is about. And we realized that we didn't like it either, but that's a whole nother video for another day. But when I was really young, I have memories of watching on Fox Kids Network, Spider-Man and his amazing friends. But I was born in the early 2000s, so I obviously grew up watching the animated series from the 90s. I don't really remember a whole lot about Spider-Man and his amazing friends, other than the fact that there was Iceman and Firestar, of course, and I thought I liked it. But after re-watching it now and doing research for this video and this tier list that I'm doing with all the Spider-Man animated shows, I gotta say, it does not hold up as well as I thought it would. So before we get into Spider-Man and his amazing friends, we of course have to talk about Spider-Man 1981. Now upon first glance, you might think that both of these series are connected, and I thought they were too going into this. I thought Spider-Man 1981 came out, and then like later in 1981, Spider-Man and his amazing friends came out. But Actually, upon doing research, both of these series premiered on the exact same day. Now, what does that mean? I have no idea. I don't know why they did that. So are they connected? Is one just a solo story about Spider-Man? And then one is a story about Spider-Man and his amazing friends? Mm, kinda. They're not canonical together. They are not in the same universe. Even though in Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends, there's a flashback scene of an episode with Magneto from the 81 series. And they have the same voice actor for Peter Parker, if my memory services me well, and the animation and art style is the exact same. So, no, even though they were released on the same exact day, and they have flashbacks from one series referring to the other, and the same animation, and the exact same intro, one just says Spider-Man. Spider-Man! And one just says Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Spider-Man and his amazing friends! So no, they are not, one is not a sequel to the other and they are not connected even though it doesn't make any sense why they're not, but nonetheless. Before we get into that, please consider subscribing. Only 97% of you guys that watch the videos are actually subscribed, so please consider subscribing. It just helps the channel, helps me grow, helps me reach a larger audience, and just lets me know that you guys like the videos I'm making and want me to make more. That being said, if there's any ideas that you guys have after this tier list that I'm doing is complete, let me know, I'm open to ideas. But let's just get into 1981 Spider-Man. First thing I want to say about this series is in a post-spectacular Spider-Man world, and in a world where the 90s animated series came out as well, this show doesn't do anything new and anything groundbreaking. If you were to flash back all the way to the 1980s, I bet I would have loved this show when it first came out. It's got very, like, obviously to me now it's retro vibes, but it's, it fits right in with the art style of, like, Super Friends, which is actually what I think inspired Spider-Man and his amazing friends as they were trying to reach the, like, DC Justice League Super Friends kind of vibe. But that being said, the art style for both series, especially just the standalone Spider-Man series, is pretty nice. It holds up. It's a whole lot better than the art style and the animation, especially from the 60s Spider-Man, where when Spider-Man would swing in that, it would just be like a stagnant line and he would go across the screen. Whereas in this, it's actually like liquid. It's fluid. <laughs> you can actually see Spider-Man going back and forth. So within those 20 years, the animation from the 60s to the 80s series is phenomenal. It's a whole lot better. But once again, comparing that to everything else I have on this tier list, like Ultimate Spider-Man, Spider-Man Unlimited, the animated series from the 90s, even uh, the new animated series as well, and of course Spectacular Spider-Man, all these shows are leagues above the 1981 series and Spider-Man His Amazing Friends. So I can't give it too much credit, but I also really don't want to knock it down because what it was at the time was probably really successful and really big. Speaking of what it was at the time, especially for the standalone Spider-Man series, there is always constant quips and like subliminal messaging to the kids. Not anything weird like conspiracy theorists will always say about subliminal messaging, but Spider-Man will be swinging by and he'll be like, well, it's a good thing I took my vitamins. That's how I was able to defeat the bad guy. Stuff like that goes on all the time and you can just tell the era that this is in and it's, I feel like is really stuck into like the early 80s, 70s type of vibe. But because of that, the character designs I feel like are really strong, except for Doc Ock. I do not like his design. I like the colorways, like the classic yellow and green, but just something about his like pointy goggles I was not a fan of. But character design-wise, you have characters like the Lizard, Vulture, Sandman that are very, very similar to their comic book counterparts. And honestly, I really like them. They fit the time period that this show is based in. Speaking of the time period that this show is based in, Peter Parker, Betty Brant, which Betty Brant is the only love interest in this show. There's no MJ or Gwen, which I 
I don't really know why that happened, but that was a unique decision they did. And Peter's always constantly having to do the, you know, like Peter Parker stuff or Spider-Man stuff and make the hard decision to not go out on dates with Betty. He's always being flaky, but Betty Brant and Peter Parker, for the time period that they're in, their clothing is actually one of the things that I noticed that stuck out. Like in Spectacular Spider-Man or the animated series, like in Spectacular Spider-Man, he has baggy pants on, which is more like a 2000s sort of thing or the 90s series. He's got a collared shirt. Peter in this has like a bright blue, like yellow and blue sweater and like jeans and turtleneck outfit and stuff. Very, very like late 70s when this was probably being like animated type of vibe, which I thought was pretty cool. This series as a whole has a whole lot of safe storytelling narratives when it comes to like the overall plots of the show. The two that stuck out to me that were the most bizarre was the Mysterio and the Doctor Doom plot, which by the way, I'm gonna get this out right now. Doctor Doom for the Spider-Man 81 series is the main bad guy. Like we get characters like Magneto that show up as a villain before the Green Goblin. And the Green Goblin only has one episode where he has this like comic book amnesia thing from a battle they once previously had where he remembers who like Spider-Man is, that he's Peter Parker, it's not that good. But Doctor Doom is the main villain overall, and he is constantly like brainwashing people, not through like any magical powers, but like he's trying to take over and be president, either president of the United States or like dictator of the world don't really remember, but he's trying to like, come into power and he is using like his propaganda and his persuasiveness and he gets people like J. Jonah Jameson, which shows this like stark contrast between J. Jonah Jameson and Peter is like, Peter's always trying to do whatever he can to be Spider-Man and do the right thing. And J. Jonah Jameson, like the, the blink of an eye, like switches and is on Dr. Doom's side, which I know J. Jonah Jameson is always against Spider-Man, but something about this adaptation really shows like the direct contrast between the two characters, which I personally enjoyed. But you have characters like Doctor Doom and Mysterio that have these arcs that feel really out of place. One of the most interesting ones and like the most memorable one that I have was the Mysterio episode where, you know, instead of Mysterio doing his normal like smoke and mirrors stuff, I kid you not, he brainwashed people and like mind controlled them, like with actual powers, not like the persuasiveness of Doctor Doom. He mind controlled people with rock and roll music. With a clever little touch of my own added in. It looks like something straight out of the SpongeBob movie where Plankton puts on like the helmets and like mind controls people where they're like walking like this. It is insane. <laughs> And th his whole goal is to destroy Spider-Man. And as soon as he like gets to the mob to put their hands on Spider-Man, you'd think they're gonna like curb stomp him and like get him all together and just kick him and kill him and stuff. But no, they just pick him up and like deliver him to Mysterio. It's one of the cheesiest and goofiest like Spider-Man episodes I've ever seen. Must destroy Spider-Man. Aha. And it was nothing to do with the character of Mysterio. Mysterio was just like a stand-in because Mysterio sometimes plays tricks on people like that. But normally it's like smoke and mirrors and all this crazy like theater stuff, which there's a little bit at the very end where he explains his backstory of being like a theater person, but it... It was just insane. The main thing I want to say taking away from these episodes is there's a lot of story arcs that are very like cut and dry to like the standard Spider-Man media level. And then there's a whole lot of stuff that's just doesn't make sense, like the Doctor Doom and Mysterio thing. Last thing I want to say about Doctor Doom is you can tell that he was very much inspired by Darth Vader, especially with the way he sounds and how deep his voice is with like the helmet and everything. And like obviously he has the helmet and the cape and other adaptations. But you can just tell like where this is in like the 80s and 70s and stuff going on with Star Wars, Doctor Doom being the main villain for this Spider-Man series is inspired by Darth Vader. It's the wall crawler! Yes, I've been expecting him. It's insane. I, I like Doctor Doom. I don't think he's like the, ever a main Spider-Man villain to my knowledge. So that was a very interesting decision. Going to put Spider-Man 1981 on the tier list. I'm just going to put it at C tier. There's not a whole lot about this show other, other than the iconic like transition sound. And I don't want to look it up to see if like a Batman with Adam West did this or if it was this series, but the transition like, -na 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 -na, I'll put it on screen right now and like play a clip of it. Nutcase is still on the loose. This is one of the most iconic, unless it didn't come from this series. If it did not come from 1981 Spider-Man, please let me know. But the like transition between the scenes is insane. It is so 
incredibly iconic. I have to put this at C tier. There's not a whole lot about this series that I think is groundbreaking. Like Peter just gets thrust right into action all the time. Aunt May hates Spider-Man, all this sort of stuff. So I'm not a huge fan of just this series overall. It doesn't do anything that I would say is like groundbreaking, especially in today's media landscape with other Spider-Man media. I'm just gonna put this on C tier with Spider-Man Unlimited. You can put it on the background. It's not a bad show by any means. It just does not stack up compared to anything else on this list. So Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends follows the story of Peter Parker, the exact same Peter Parker from the other series, but it's for some reason not connected to this one. It's so confusing. Peter Parker, Bobby Drake, Iceman, and Angelica Jones, Firestar. And you might be asking if you're not familiar with the series, who Firestar is? Well, right back, actually, it's a bit over there. She was actually iconic enough to make it into the UCS Davy Bugle Lego set. Firestar, they wanted her to be the Human Torch, but due to like, behind the scenes contractual obligations and licensing issues and stuff. They could not put the Human Torch in this series. And why, like I get the fire and ice contrast, but fire, ice, and spiders doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but you would think, okay, Firestar is just the Human Torch, but as a girl. But instead I did a whole deep dive on her character. Like she used to be a member of the X-Men during the Uncanny Days. She was an Avenger at one time. She's shown up in other Spider-Man media that's not canonical to this, but like winks back at this series. Very, very interesting, whole lot of stuff, but her powers are actually like microwave radiational powers where instead of like producing fireballs and like turning herself on fire, like how Johnny Storm does and throwing fireballs and all that stuff, instead she irradiates the energy and like fields around her to put fire around her and like she will catch stuff on fire. So if you have like my water bottle, right? Um, Johnny Storm would like throw a fireball at it. She would just make it catch on fire. So it's a whole different set of power skills, but very surface level, f boom, fire is hot, right? So she's a fire mutant. But this series follows the three of them living out of Aunt May's house where they have what can only be a ripoff of the Super Friends Batcave where all this stuff, like the furniture flips on its side to reveal all their stuff, like all their gear and computers and stuff. Very gimmicky. Um, but this series just follows the three of them trying to do their homework, like struggling to do like the standard Peter Parker superhero life of, of fighting villains and then doing their homework and completing college and stuff and going on date nights and stuff. There's just not a whole lot about this series that stands out to me. The only thing is Video Man. There are a lot of characters in this show, similar to the new animated series, they just came up with original characters for this series. But there was a whole lot of characters in the show that I just felt like were utter misses, except for Video Man. And one of the only like core memories I have of watching this show when I was younger was the Video Man episode where he sucks in Peter Parker, Flash Thompson, Bobby Drake Iceman, and Angelica Jones Firestar into a video game and the whole point is it's like this retro arcade video game where like if they can kill them in the video game they'll kill them in real life and then he can like jump out and then take over new york because he knows he has no chance fighting them outside of the video game and then flash thompson is actually the one that saves the day pretty interesting episode some of the episodes it's like standard spider-man stuff they're fighting regular villains the costume design um, and character designs are like almost identical to the series beforehand so nothing i can say about this show to give it enough praise to step over the just straight up 81 spider-man series but going back to the episode structure and how it works is there'll be some episodes that are very like by the book standard Spider-Man and his three friends that's a ripoff of the Super Friends fighting these villains and then there'll be like weird episodes where it feels like you're not even watching anything Spider-Man related and I don't know the reason behind this like for example there's episodes where they're fighting these like weird animal beast hybrids or they go to outer space they just do a lot of stuff that isn't necessarily like bad but it just is not entertaining at least in my perspective you know the whole reason i do the list is it's like my opinion um so if you liked it that's awesome i enjoyed the series i just didn't like love it some of the best parts of the series though are like the iceman and firestar origin stories those are pretty cool so if you're gonna watch the series i'd recommend checking those out one thing i didn't really know where to put this in but firestar is not mj she's her own character and like little me when i was watching this series i'm like 
Angelica Jones, that's MJ, because like J is Jones, MJ. But turns out there's no other love interest for Peter Parker. There's a little bit of an on again, off again with Angelica Jones, but at the end of the series, Spider Man dates an inhuman alien, and like that's where the series ends. Like the Firestar and Iceman go off with the X Men, and then Peter is essentially like it cuts to black with her and him, like with Peter and this like inhuman alien. It's so weird. It comes out of left field, comes out of absolutely nowhere. So I would check it out if this sounds interesting to you. The best thing about this show by far is the intro. I love like the Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Like that is extremely iconic to me. I think that's the best part of this series. In theory, this show would work really well if he had other team members. Like I don't really like the trio idea unless it's a trio like the big three in DC, Batman, Wonder Woman, and Superman, where you know that they're gonna mesh and work well together. Why are we making a series of the big three or like a trio with Firestar or with fire powers, Iceman with ice powers, and Spider-Man with spider powers? Like two of those could work very well, having like the fire and ice dynamic and combo. And there's even episodes, I believe it was an episode where they were trapped with Kraven, where Firestar was constantly being like, wet with water and being frozen and Iceman was constantly being heated up like those episodes are interesting and that concept is interesting but why are we pairing them with spider-man other than to just get Iceman more exposure because he was already popular at the time but I just I don't know why and like what the creative decision behind all of this was so I can't really boast too much about this show I think this series would work better as a Spider-Man and friends sort of adaptation like yeah he has his two amazing friends with him but Ultimate Spider-Man does a really good job even early on of like establishing okay this is going to be a Spider-Man and friends esque show so when we're introduced to multiple different characters throughout that series it doesn't seem like it's coming out of nowhere only having Spider-Man, Iceman, and Firestar team up together as the core like trio throughout the series, it just makes it feel less impactful when the core trio works with other people like the X-Men and Captain America. It makes me almost want and like long for a Spider-Man and Friends TV show with this like 70s, 80s retro aesthetic. That's where I think this series like succeeds at is being a Spider-Man and Friends sort of narrative when they're going on different wacky adventures. But when you're constantly going through the high highs and low lows of the show, like doing drastic left and right decisions of not knowing tonally what this show wants to look like. Half of the show feels like it's this grounded Spider-Man story. And then there's this other side that's like pulling, trying to drag out this show to become this like super friend, Spider-Man and friend sort of show. And I feel like there's a loss of identity and there's like an identity crisis with this show with that happening. I don't think that this show really succeeds as a whole, but I think there's a lot of potential with this show and it is a fun show. Just stacking it up on a tier list or even just comparing it to other animated cartoons that are out there, superhero cartoons that is, I think that's where this show falls apart is when it's stacked up against and compared to other series. As a standalone show with its own narrative, this is an enjoyable watch, but again, I don't think it's anything groundbreaking. I don't think it's anything super special to write home about. One more cool thing about this series is that at the time, Stanley did not do like the voiceover narration, but after the popularity and the success of the show, later on when it went to like VHS or DVD, or just when they aired past like previous episodes on the network, Stanley was actually brought in to do the voiceover for the narration, which I think is pretty cool and RIP Stanley. But yeah, that's really all I have about this series. The way it ends isn't anything crazy. It's like the X-Men come in and it kind of just abruptly ends, but there is a comic where Merlin is like traveling interdimensionally, going to different universes, and he kills Spider-Man, Firestar, and Iceman. And I think the exact same thing happens with Spider-Man Unlimited as well. So I I don't really know. I, I wouldn't like this. I mean, if this series gets picked up in the future, that'd be cool, but I'm championing obviously for Spectacular Spider-Man and the 90s animated series. I do think it's cool how like looking back, this is one of those smaller shows, but it did have an impact on Spider-Man culture as a whole. Like I said, with the UCS Lego set, Iceman's not in there because he's more of an X-Men character, but Firestar, who was an original character created purposely for this show because they couldn't get a Johnny Storm. She's in this, so like obviously her popularity has risen up. Like I said, she's an X-Men at one point because she does have mutant powers. Um, and then she was even an Avenger for a little bit. So. The show was successful. I just didn't find a whole lot of enjoyment out of it, which is sad because I always thought in my mind, and really when I was going to make this list, I'm like, okay, Spectacular Spider-Man in the 90s series, those are S tier. 
obviously. Everything else I hadn't seen besides Spider-Man Unlimited, and I know that show's not the best, but it holds a soft spot in my heart. But I was like, where am I going to put Spider-Man and his amazing friends? And I was thinking A tier. And then I rewatched this, or then I watched this series specifically for this video. It's not A tier. I'm going to put it either at a C or a D plus. I'll see what I end up deciding to do. But I, I did enjoy it purely for the nostalgic reasons, and it is a little bit of a different show. But yeah, that's really all I have regarding this series. Nothing cr too crazy, but it's a good show to put on the back. Actually, I'm just going to put it at C tier because C tier is the middle of the line. So, like, I don't consider anything in C tier to be bad, but I don't consider anything in C tier to be amazing. So, kind of like I, what I said with Spider Man Unlimited, you can put both of these series on in the background while you're, like, vacuuming or doing the dishes or whatever. And it's a good, I like the retro vibe. It's pretty standard nothing groundbreaking if you want to watch better spider-man series or better spider-man content there's a whole lot more out there but yeah just gonna put these two at c tier spider-man spider-man does whatever a spider can the spider-man animated series from 1967 is by far the most meme spider-man series and probably the most memeable spider-man series we're ever gonna get and for good reason this show is riddled with bad animation flat voice acting, reused shots, and overall tonal whiplash between each episode. But besides that, I still really enjoyed this series for the most part. The Spider-Man 67 series is split into three seasons, with the first season is split into a total of 20 episodes, but since each episode has two individual arcs, there's really 40 episodes in season one alone. And then in season two, each episode is a full 20 minute length long episode, with a total of 19 episodes in season two, and then season three is a mixed bag of both, where some episodes have the half and half structure like in season one, and then some episodes are just the standard 20 minute length, with the total number of episodes in season three being 13, and the total number of episodes in the whole series being 52. This show took a long time to watch and has a lot packed into it. So what did I think of the series? Well, it's complicated. When I first started watching season one, I really, really enjoyed the show. Not like that it's this groundbreaking series or it does anything different that we haven't seen in Spider-Man media, but it was fun. I went into this with the expectation of like, yeah, obviously this is the most memeable Spider-Man series and probably for good reason because of stuff like the poor animation, the reused shots, the voice acting being okay at best and sometimes. So I didn't really know what to think going into this. But before we get into my exact thoughts, I just want to say I'm not comparing this show on an animation stand. I think that would be very ignorant of myself. When trying to compare the animation of this to the quality that we have nowadays with two Spider-Verse films, Spectacular, and even the animated series from the 90s, the animation on this does not hold up and it's honestly, it's just like a time capsule from the 60s of where the show stands. It's very cute looking at the art style retroactively, but it's nothing groundbreaking. So if you're going to watch this show like I did, go into it knowing that you're not going to see anything groundbreaking in this show from a visual standpoint. If anything, you're going to get very annoyed with 90% of the establishing shots being reused from prior episodes, which is due to the lack of budgeting with this show, but that's a whole nother topic later on for the video. One thing you need to think about when reviewing this show is that this premiered five years after Amazing Fantasy 15, which was Spider-Man's first appearance, so the showrunners really didn't have a whole lot to go off of. Yeah, there was five years worth of comics, and I believe it was around 50 issues that Spider-Man had appeared in that they could base a lot of the characters off of, but there wasn't a whole lot of source material. Like nowadays, whether you're making a comic book, a movie, or a TV show regarding Spider-Man, you have 50 plus years worth of Spider-Man content to pull from with those stories and those different characters and narratives, where this is the first appearance of Spider-Man in television, and there was only five years of source material before this. And a lot of Spider-Man villains didn't take their footing and started becoming more popular until later on in Spider-Man's runtime, so a lot of the characters that were drawn from the show, they were either just original characters that the showrunners kind of just had to make up because they didn't have a lot to go off of, or they were Spider-Man's more iconic villains like Green Goblin, Vulture, Electro, Scorpion, and Rhino, but even the versions of those characters that I just spoke about are watered down extremely compared to the counterparts that we know in other forms of media nowadays. So how is the Web Slinger's first appearance in television? It's all right. I really, really enjoyed season one. I think it's at its peak when each of these mini episodes doesn't have a whole lot of backstory for Peter or these villains. They just kind of throw you right into the action. Like take the Vulture episode, for example. The Vulture just comes in out of nowhere on Spider-Man and it's just this crazy old man flying in a bird costume. And there's no backstory, no explanation for any of this. They even have a power for Vulture where he can control the minds of birds, but there is no explanation for hardly anything with these characters. And I think that's where this show is at its best. You just take Spider-Man, you throw him into an episode with a bunch of bad guys, 
and you try and have him defeat him, he defeats him, and then that's the end of the episode. Later on in the series in seasons two and three, they have these more long, drawn-out episodes to pad for runtime because they're not doing the half-episode structure that's in season one, and a lot of the shots are just reused shots from previous episodes, or you have things like Spider-Man web-swinging, and they just stay on that stagnant shot for probably like 30 seconds just so they can pad that runtime. I think this series is at its best when you have the short and sweet action. Not to say that there aren't good episodes later on in the series. Season two, his very first episode, is a basically one-to-one -one recreation of Spider-Man's origin story. Him becoming a fighter, not stopping the guy at the door, being selfish, and then that guy later on kills Uncle Ben. That episode is brilliant. It's amazing. It's it's really, really good. And it's the whole 20-minute length. I think the series is at its best when it's in those short 10-minute interval episodes where they can just throw in some wacky guy, like the episode with Scorpion. Scorpion, he... To my knowledge, he's never done this in other adaptations, but Scorpion gets injected with, like, the serum the, the guy's creating, like, the scientist, and then he becomes this, like, huge, like, kaiju-sized monster that's the size of buildings, and Spider-Man doesn't know how to defeat him, and it's just so entertaining. It's wacky, it's ridiculous, it's campy. I think this is where the show is at its best. A perfect example of the wackiness and weirdness for this series is nowhere else but the first opening montage with the theme song of Spider-Man. There's part of the montage where a steel beam is falling on top of Spider-Man, and he just one hand catches it, defies gravity and all the laws of physics, and then just swings on with it. There's a lot of stuff like that, whether they didn't have the budget or they couldn't actually create the animation of these great feats that they accomplished, I don't know, and I'm not going to look into it any further than just watching the series. But in the very first episode, Peter Parker, for some reason, is driving a car instead of swinging a Spider-Man, and he recklessly falls off a cliff, and he just makes sort of like a web parachute with his car. They land, It lands safely, and then he throws his web almost like a lasso to get his car to bring it back down to the ground once it lands on a tree. I'll put a video of it on screen. It is so odd, but it sets the tone for the series right then and there, especially in 2024, watching this like, okay, this is going to be different than anything else I've seen. Another instance is the Mysterio episode where Spider-Man is fighting Mysterio and his goons that are like dressed up as pirates and they all have pirate swords and Spider-Man just spins a web and makes his own web sword. And then he just fights off the goons with his sword made out of webs. It is ridiculous, and that takes me to the next thing I want to talk about, which is in this series, Spider-Man does not act like any other version of Spider-Man in a sense of his powers. He creates things like a web slingshot, like a physical slingshot that he shoots a ball of web with. He makes a web shield. He makes a big square out of webs. He makes a web boat. It's like the creators didn't really know what to do with Spider-Man. Like I said, because he had only been out for five years, they didn't have a lot of source material. So they were maybe trying to establish and make canon that Spider-Man can make things out of his webs. I honestly don't know, but I find it hilarious. I know Spider-Man in the past is able to make like web parachutes and you see stuff like that in Ultimate Spider-Man where he does wacky things with his different types of webs. Like there's web grenades and shock webs and stuff like that's different. But when Spider-Man's making a whole pontoon boat out of webs, that's absurd. Speaking of the absurdity in the show, a lot of the episodes follow a very similar structure. Where the villains do some sort of crime, Spider-Man gets framed, and then Spider-Man goes and tries to clear his name and defeat the villains, only to be defeated or realize that he's undermatched, then he goes back to his house, he has a chemistry lab set up, and he creates whatever type of webs are needed to solve the problem, and then that's how he defeats the villains. This happens multiple times throughout the series, and it gets very repetitive. Along with that, once the webs are created, like the new special webs, there's no visual imagery on the screen to show that like, oh, these are shock webs, or these webs are actually like made out of metal, and they're really strong. They just look the exact same every single time. Something that doesn't look the exact same every single time though is Peter Parker's face. Along with Spider-Man's designs and people like Captain Stacy, it just looks completely different, and I mean completely different throughout the series. I know season one had a different animation company than season two and three, but there's, to my knowledge, no character models made for this show. You'll have scenes in the same episode, and then also in different seasons, but you'll have scenes in the same episode where Peter Parker looks a specific way, puts on the mask, does the Spider-Man stuff, takes it off, and looks completely different after. The last good thing I want to say about this series before I speak completely negative about this show is that this show was not afraid to take chances and to try new things. 
I know in my review for Spider-Man the new animated series, I said that I despised all of the original characters and villains that they made in that show, and I'll stand by that. But in this series, they added a whole lot of new different villains and wacky characters that nowadays I would be looking down upon because, like, why are you making these new characters and villains when you have a plethora of source material to pull from? But since this show was created five years after Spider-Man's first appearance, there wasn't a whole lot to go off of. There's one episode where there's these two guys called, like, the Fly Guys, and they basically just stick to the wall and kind have like a grapple gun like black cat and they do it's a really compelling episode because they just do a heist and they confuse spider-man and this is where i want to get into the stuff that i didn't like about the series because this version of spider-man is awful. He will just completely fall off rooftops sometimes or his web will get snapped and he'll just fall straight to the ground and get knocked out. He'll get knocked out by a punch. He has almost no spider sense in this series. There'll be different things that like he's trapped in like behind bars and instead of breaking the bars like normal Spider-Man adaptations can because he's super strong this guy's like well I'm stuck or he'll get webbed up or get tight like caught up in a rope and he'll just stand there and be like well there's nothing I can do I mean it's no wonder the big gag in Across the Spider-Verse is that this version of Spider-Man swings so statically and slow because he does this Spider-Man sucks as a Spider-Man it's a fun watch watching all like the goofy villains and the version of Green Goblin is always trying to steal like witchcraft and mystical stuff. Electro just shoots out little pointy things and isn't really that menacing. Rhino is a bumbling Tom and Jerry fool where he just statically runs across the screen. This isn't a great show, but it is encapsulated in the 60s and is something looking back retroactively from 2024. It has charm to it, but it's nothing I could recommend in good conscience to Spider-Man friends. The tonal whiplash between seasons one and two and three is night and day. And so if I had to rank just season one, I would probably put it in a B tier because of how fun and campy it is. But comparing this as one whole show, I'm gonna put it on D tier. There's not a whole lot in this show that I unironically thought like, wow, that's a great episode. Except for two episodes in this series that I thought were done very well. The first one I already talked about, which was just a ripped one-to-one adaptation of Spider-Man's origin story, so I don't really count that because they were pulling stuff straight from the source material. The episode that I thought stuck out a lot to me was the episode where Spider-Man is stuck in prison after being, he gets knocked out and the public is trying to unmask him, so the police take him and put him in jail, not because he's in jail, but they just keep him in jail so he doesn't get unmasked by the public. And once he wakes up, he realizes that he's kind of injured because the Spider-Man sucks and is pathetic and is always weak and injured. And he's like, well, I have to escape. But then he realizes a lot of the prisoners had broken out and have Captain Stacy hostage. And so he turns off the lights throughout the prison and throughout the whole episode, he's just like one by one and picking apart the prison guards, which I really like. This episode was pretty enjoyable, but this show is just something else, man. The worst thing this series does is be boring. And oh my gosh, it is boring a lot. A lot of the series is just padded for runtime because yeah, the animation quality is poor because it was in the 60s. They probably had a very, very, very low budget. So a lot of the frames, a lot of the shots, a lot of everything is reused. A lot of voice acting is reused. A lot of frames with previous characters are like the vulture is used in an episode in season three that is in season one. Like they use it from season one in season three. It's just Ugh, this show is a mess and it's definitely something that's stuck in the past. One thing that did stick out to me about this series is that unlike almost every Spider-Man animated series besides Ultimate Spider-Man, this show does not end on a cliffhanger. This series ends in the most fitting way for the series. Peter f is swinging, his web gets shot out, which is never explained. This is in the finale, by the way. He falls into a train car and there's a little boy there who's wanting to run away. And so the kid asks, oh, Spider-Man, like, should I run away? And so Peter gives him advice for like 30 seconds total. He says like, you shouldn't run away because what are you gonna do when you run away? And the kid's like, oh, I wanna be like you. I wanna be the Spider-Man of this one town. And he said, well, do you have what it takes? And the kid's like, what do you mean do I have what it takes? So Peter gives him advice on how to be a superhero for like two sentences and then for a whole 10 minute series. And it's just a flashback from one of the episodes prior. So you have a 10 minute montage flashback, which is just 10 minutes of a previous episode. And the kid says, wow, I don't wanna be like that. I, like that sounds hard. And Peter says, that is hard. Here's another example. And it just shows another 10 minutes of a prior episode, just a straight cut, no, no montages or cuts or anything, just straight 10 minutes of a previous episode. And that happens I think two or three times. And then at the end, the kid says, yeah, that sounds like, like that sounds like that sucks. Why would I want to be a superhero? You're getting beat up all the time. You're awful. Like you have you have a bad life. And the kid runs away and Peter just stands there with his hands on his hips and is like, "Yeah, 
that sucks or something like that and then it just cuts to black and that's the end of the series the series finale is just like three different clips of previous episodes of reused footage like this show is something else man it's no wonder people make fun of this show but there were a lot of enjoyable moments so i wouldn't say this is a terrible show i would re-watch the good episodes of this multiple multiple times over rewatching the new animated series and i'll stand by that so again i'm gonna put this in d tier but that's really all i have regarding this series there's not a whole lot i have to say other than just get together with some friends if you're gonna watch this or go on youtube and watch a clip of the montage of all the weirdness and wacky stuff in this show because it is awful <laughs> this show it, it does some very creative things and then it also just reuses footage for about 70 percent of the series as a whole Spider-Man 2017 isn't anything special, and I could honestly end the video right there regarding the series, but after watching a total of three seasons and over 24 hours worth of the show, I feel like I've wasted a lot of my time watching this show, so let me explain to you why this series isn't that special. Mainly what I mean by this series not standing out is in the year of 2017 when this series came out, and then when I'm watching it right now in 2024, there are so many other Spider-Man series. Just looking at what I have next to me, we have Spectacular Spider-Man, which is a very short and concise Peter Parker Spider-Man-centric story that has a lot of his rogues gallery but doesn't really expand outside of the standard Spider-Man characters. Then we have the Spider-Man series from the 90s that has basically every rogue of Spider-Man and Peter Parker that you could think of, along with characters like the X-Men, Daredevil, and Captain America that make appearances showing that this whole series is in its own universe. Then we have Ultimate Spider-Man, which is basically Spider-Man and his ragtag group of teenagers that all have superpowers and all go to this school, where then they learn how to work with S.H.I.E.L.D. and fight the greater universe. They have multiverse plots, they have time-traveling plots, they have so many different Spider-Verse plots. That show has so much crammed into, like, I think the four seasons it has, there's a lot of content in that series. You have Spider-Man Unlimited, which is 2099 Spider-Man meets Batman Beyond with Venom and Carnage in space, which is its own micro-series as it is. There's Spider-Man 1981, there's Spider-Man and his amazing friends, which are set on the same path chronologically, I think, where Spider-Man has Firestar and Iceman, and they just team up with the, the trio of them, and they go and fight crime. Then you have the very first Spider-Man animated series from the 60s. Is it anything spectacular? No, but it's a good time capsule to go back in time and watch some of the first ever animation of Spider-Man. Very simple, very basic, very interesting and fun. And then you have the MTV Spider-Man series, which is a continuation of the original Sam Raimi Spider-Man, but it's set between Spider-Man 1 and Spider-Man 2, and then once Spider-Man 2 came out, it's no longer canonical. It's basically a what-if between Spider-Man and Spider-Man 2. Now, after I've just detailed all of Spider-Man's animated series, where does Spider-Man 2017 stack up and stand out amongst all of those? And the answer is not really anywhere. Starting with just the name Spider-Man, that's the series name, Spider-Man. So I'm calling it Spider-Man 2017 because that's when it was released. I've seen people call it Marvel's Spider-Man or Spider-Man 2017, just Spider-Man. It's just talking about the series alone, unless you know exactly what I'm talking about, you're going to get confused amongst all the other Spider-Man content out there. After watching all of the series and dedicating a lot of my time to it, I want to point out and highlight three reasons why I think this series does not stand out amongst all the other Spider-Man animated series. I'm going to briefly go over the three reasons why I think this series doesn't stand out, and then I'm going to run to the plot, talk about the good things I like of the show, talk about a lot of the bad stuff I don't like, and then kind of wrap this whole thing up. My first gripe with this series on why it doesn't stand out is it's basically copying Ultimate Spider-Man. This series follows Peter Parker, Miles Morales, Gwen and Anya. I don't really know who Anya is, but long story short, these four characters, Peter turns into Spider-Man, Miles turns into Miles Morales Spider-Man, Gwen turns into Ghost Spider, Spider-Gwen, and Anya, I don't know her last name, turns into Spider-Woman. Now, right off the bat, you have these four main team characters that we're following, and there's a few other friends that are in there, but you have this main cast of four characters that are going to the school called Horizon High. Horizon High is basically a school for the gifted and talented. Think of it like the X-Men, except it's not all super-powered kids. Honestly, none of them are super-powered except for the four I just mentioned. They're all just really and extremely smart, and so they're always building these projects, which is a good plot device to explain why all this crazy stuff is going on. Compare that to Ultimate Spider-Man, you have this school funded by S.H.I.E.L.D. and Nick Fury where they all have superpowers and that's your plot device to explain why so much stuff is happening all the time. That's only in the later season of Ultimate Spider-Man, I think it's season 3 and 4 where they have the S.H.I.E.L.D. school, but you have your main group of characters in Ultimate Spider-Man that actually go, to, I believe, to Midtown and they're superheroes in disguise amongst regular people. Kind of exactly what Horizon High is doing in Spider-Man 2017. It's just copying, basically, the plot copy-paste from season 1 of Ultimate Spider-Man 
thrown right into Spider-Man 2017. Along with the things that are being copied from Ultimate Spider-Man, it feels like a lot of the art style, specifically with the text and logo that they use in the subtitles and just the style and design of Spider-Man, a lot. it's kind of hard to explain from someone who's not an animator like myself. It just feels like it's ripped right out of Ultimate Spider-Man. Even the, the intro seems like it's almost just exactly the same as Ultimate Spider-Man with just a few things changed. I just can't help but watch this and then look right at Ultimate Spider-Man, the series that actually came chronologically closer to this series than any other series. Ultimate Spider-Man ended and then this show started I believe like two or three years later. My second reason for why this series really doesn't stand out and my biggest complaint I have with it is it tries to tie in into the MCU but it doesn't commit to the bit fully. There's probably a lot of behind the scenes problems and drama or whatever on why this actually this Peter Parker and this story isn't the Peter Parker in the MCU. Hey, and that's totally fine, especially with Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man coming out later this year. That's going to be to my knowledge a prequel to our Tom Holland's Peter Parker Spider-Man set freshman year. That's its own thing. But the series, it feels like they're trying to do every single thing they can to like lean forward and inch into being in the MCU. You can make the argument that, oh, this Iron Man is, looks and sounds just like Tony Stark, but Tony Stark was not widely known to the degree that is he that he is now with Robert Downey Jr. So I don't want to say that's the only reason why it sounds like he's from the MCU, but characters like Captain America, Thor, Hulk, all of their designs are very, very, Black Widow, all of them are very close to their MCU designs, and Spider-Man does the same thing that he does in Spider-Man Homecoming and Infinity War, where he's like, am I an Avenger yet? Am I an Avenger? And it's kind of like fanboying over Iron Man. He does that along with so many other things that tie into the MCU, which actually aren't a part of the MCU, though. It feels like they won't commit to the bit fully. And that's one thing that's just really frustrating and annoying when you have it in your mind going into this series. I'll touch upon this third part more when I get to the part about the series that I didn't like, but the third thing I have to say why this series doesn't stand out is Peter Parker does not feel special in all the series that I just mentioned. Peter Parker is Spider-Man. He is the main character in all of these series. Yes, he's the main character in Spider-Man 2017, but he doesn't stand out. In season one, where I believe the show peaks, and I'll get into that later, in season one, we see Gwen Stacy get her own powers and Miles Morales get their own spider powers. And it's revealed in the origin episode, Peter Parker gets his spider, kind of like the Amazing Spider-Man movies, where he got it in a lab where they're creating these spiders, not like a one-off thing. They're creating these spiders. Spoiler alert, the jackal is to create spider-powered people. And that's how Miles gets his powers too, not at the same time, but... The four spider people that I mentioned, Anya, Spider-Woman, Miles Morales, Spider-Man, Ghost Spider, Gwen Stacy, Spider-Woman, and Peter Parker, Spider-Man, they all have the exact same powers, except for Miles Morales because I believe this was when Miles was kind of stepping into his own character around the comics time in 2017, where he has his invisibility powers, he has his electroshock powers, and then all the other Spider-Man powers. If you have your four main characters and they all have essentially the same exact skill set, how does Peter Parker stand out amongst this? Peter Parker is not the smartest amongst his friend group. The only like edge he has against the other spider people are that he's somewhat, and I mean somewhat more mature than characters like Miles because Miles in this is reduced down to comic relief and he's like a 12 year old with powers. That's its own issue. And then Peter Parker, I think has like four months of seniority over the other spider people, which in terms of being a superhero and grasping your powers and stuff, isn't much because very quickly Anya when she becomes Spider-Woman and Gwen when, when she becomes Ghost Spider, they're killing it. They're doing their own thing as a duo. And it like I just couldn't help but think the whole time like, why are we following Peter Parker except for the fact that Peter is always a Spider-Man. He is always the main Spider-Man. Cause yeah, I love Peter Parker, but in this adaptation, Peter isn't doing anything special. He, why are we following him when there's very more interesting characters like Harry Osborn that I'll get into, where I believe he has the most important and most interesting arc throughout all three seasons. But those are the main three reasons why I feel like this series doesn't stand out as any sort of Spider-Man series. I'll get into all of them more in detail, but right now let's just summarize the plot through all three seasons real quick and then jump into the things I did like. Long story short, for season one, we get introduced to characters like Sandman, the Jackal, Norman Osborn, the Vulture, Scorpion, Rhino, Black Cat, Venom, all of Spider-Man's rogue gallery, very generic. At this point, if you've watched all the Spider-Man series, you know who you're gonna get introduced to. But the main characters that stand out to me in season one have to be Norman Osborn, the Jackal, Doc Ock, Venom, and Harry Osborn. Without going episode by episode for season one, the first half of season one follows Peter with his newfound powers, kind of coming to grips and learning how to become Spider-Man. Very standard, basic stuff, finding characters like Black Cat, Sandman, the Jackal, Vulture, 
very standard Spider-Man stuff. And then halfway through season one, Miles Morales gets his powers. We haven't even had half of a season because there's 26 episodes in season one. We haven't even had half of the season with Peter Parker Spider-Man before Miles gets his own powers. And this is just showing you where the series has taken us and how kind of we're going to speed run this stuff. It speed runs stuff very fast. In season one, we get introduced to Doc Ock, and it's not said immediately, but throughout season one, we realize that Doc Ock is actually a 19-year-old gifted kid that is just a professor at Horizon High, which, like I said, was that very special school that everyone goes to. And, of course, the standard Dr. Otto Octavius stuff happens, where he becomes ego-filled and power-hungry, and it is a little bit different. I'll speak on season two. There's a big plot with Doc Ock that actually stands out a lot in this series, but season one, Doc Ock is very by the books, and by the end of season one, he's essentially the main bad guy. Norman Osborn's the one, like the puppet master behind everything, orchestrating it. But throughout the latter half of season one, Norman Osborn is creating his own school because Harry got kicked out of Horizon High and he's creating the Osborn Academy. And it's essentially just going to be the smart school that's rivaling Horizon High. And the reason that Norman is doing this isn't because he's a nice guy, but he's trying to take all the technology and all the creations of these smart kids and find a way to make those into villains to kill Spider-Man. One issue I have with this series, which isn't necessarily explainable, but it's an interesting and I felt like a very lazy way to write this series, is there's a lot of plot points that I feel like were ripped from other Spider-Man TV shows. And we're at the point in 2024 and when this was written in 2017, it's very hard to write Spider-Man stories because everyone knows who the standard villains are going to be. If you have an origin with Spider-Man in 2024 or even 2017, like this series, you know that at some point Norman Osborn is going to be evil. At some point Venom's going to come in and is it going to be Eddie Brock or are they going to do like what they did in Insomniac Spider-Man 2 where it's Harry? There's specific things that you have to change or else the audience and people like myself who are Spider-Man fans, they're going to know exactly what to follow and how this series is going to go as a whole. So there's specific things in this series that I necessarily don't give a pass for. I couldn't help but think other series or other forms of media did this story better. At the end of season one, what it mainly comes down to is there's the Osborne Academy and then there's Horizon High and Doc Ock throughout all of the season, I'd say about three fourths of the season, he's a good guy. He's working with Spider-Man. He's an annoying egotistic professor, but he's not a villain yet. And then at the end of season one, Norman Osborne or Otto gets fired from Horizon High and Norman Osborne picks him up as a professor. He kind of goes crazy power hungry and just does standard Doc Ock stuff. But the main takeaway from season one is that at the end, Norman Osborn's dying and Harry has to inject himself with experimental stuff to help cure his dad because of comic book reasons or whatever. They can't go to the hospital. So then the Hobgoblin appears and throughout all of season one, the series does do a really good job of showing Harry become the Hob become the Hobgoblin because spoiler alert, Norman Osborn is actually the Hobgoblin. But season one, shows a whole series of events throughout multiple episodes of Harry building his orange armor, learning how to fly a glider, he gets a flaming sword that the Hobgoblin uses, and it shows Harry being this hero that's getting annoyed with Peter, does not like Spider-Man at all, so then when a Hobgoblin dressed exactly how Harry's dressed shows up and tries to kill Spider-Man, it makes sense. Us, the audience, are like, yeah, that's a natural progression of Harry's character, only for it to be revealed that it's actually Norman who's been gaslighting Harry into thinking that Harry was the Hobgoblin because Harry's passing out due to his own experimental drugs. And like I said, where I feel like this rips off other series, that's the plot to season two of Spectacular Spider-Man. Harry, we all think Harry's not the Hobgoblin, but we think he's the Green Goblin, and then it's actually shown and proven that, no, it's Norman Osborn, he's gaslighting Harry, he's going back and forth, and it's one of those things that, like, if the Green Goblin were to show up in Season 1, we would all be like, oh yeah, that's Norman Osborn, but with the Hobgoblin, since it's, like, a predecessor and it's a different character, we're like, oh, is it Harry, is it Norman, but that's already been done, and so it's just, it's annoying, but... I kind of give it a pass, but also it's ripping straight from Spectacular Spider-Man, but with an orange goblin instead of a green one? I don't know. The TLDR on Season 2 is that the first half, kind of like Season 1, is pretty forgettable. We have an interesting arc with Venom and Eddie Brock. We get introduced to characters like the Jackal, the Spot, Spider-Gwen, Gwen Stacy gets her powers, but the latter half of Season 2, in between the finale and the last arc, and then like the three quarters of the way through season two, I believe is the best arc in this series. And that's where they actually do it. They do the superior Spider-Man story arc. There's this thing, and forgive me if I'm not pronouncing it or remembering it correctly, it's called the Neurocortex, I believe. And it's essentially like Elon Musk's Neuralink, but from 2017, where you could like put your mind into machines to control it and stuff. And of course, that's how Doc Ock's gonna be able to go crazy. And that's how they explain why Doc Ock suddenly becomes evil is because his mind gets connected with the neuro cortex or whatever I just said it was called and he's able to use his 
like arms, but he's also becoming evil because of it. Where Doc Ock, he wins, he defeats Spider-Man, puts his mind in Spider-Man's body, and Spider-Man's body is inside like Doc Ock's computer mainframe. This is actually really interesting, and I'm not just saying that because it's, oh, they're doing Superior Spider-Man, because that's always a fun like arc to do, but no, this is actually really interesting. You see probably the most emotional part out of the whole series. You see the difference between Peter Parker and Otto Octavius. You see Peter is inside Otto's mind and like all of his memories are backed up in his computer. So Peter is able to relive all of Ock's memories to find out what happened to Ock, how, why is he evil? And then Doc Ock in Peter's body is getting like flashbacks of Peter's childhood. So Doc Ock completely understands why Peter's so heroic, why he's always trying to save people and always trying to do the right thing. Whereas Peter's finally understanding what went wrong with Doc and like I said the most emotional part of this is you see Doc got beaten as a kid from his abusive father because he was a nerd because he was smart and intelligent and his father was a blue collar worker who's just like oh I hate science I hate this why can't you just throw a football Otto why are you nerdy why are you doing xyz and it's just abusive to his father and he learns from his father the only way to get things in life is to use your two fists and to take what you want and to take action and that right there you see the difference between Uncle Ben and Ock's father the two people that inspired Peter and Ock it's very interesting and Peter finally takes back his own body not because he defeats Otto but because Otto realizes that he needs to be a hero because Otto starts doing stuff selfishly as soon as he gets the Spider-Man powers and then he realizes oh no 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 I need to be a hero and then that on top of Peter Parker reaching back out through a machine to Doc saying like you know the right thing for me to do is to take my body back because I'm gonna die if not and they make this they like the switch happen and it's a really really interesting arc I think it's like six episodes or something the best part of the whole series in my mind. And then right after that really awesome, really like even emotional arc, you go to probably the worst part of the series. It's the end of season two and they, they do a mech. And a mech is the big bad guy through season two. You have this really interesting, emotional and empathetic arc end of season two where the jackal is just, he has a mech. And there's a whole spider island plot where I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail of it because it's so painfully boring, of the jackal turning everyone into human spiders, and then because of that, a bunch of comic book stuff happens. But the last few episodes of season two, the jackal has a mech that Harry Osborn created because it was like his father's last legacy is to make this mech that's indestructible because it would do good for humanity, and Harry doesn't realize that it's a bad idea to make that. But, of course, Harry makes it because he's smart and has his father's blueprints for it. The Jackal steals that and then does bad guy stuff and la 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 la. The four Spider-Man that have the exact same powers and they all seem to do the exact same thing. And Harry Osborn take down the mech. And that's season two. <sighs> Time for season three. I'll speed run this one because it's titled uh, Maximum Venom, I believe. Another thing that I feel like this ripped off from Ultimate Spider-Man is the latter half of Ultimate Spider-Man. Each season was titled something. I believe season two off the top of my mind was the Sinister Six. I know season four or season three, one of them was called like a Maximum Venom. Like there was a chunk of it in the intro that would say Venom, I believe. And then something to do with like Spider Wars or like the Spider-Verse in the other ones. But the season one and two in Spider-Man 2017 just say Spider-Man, Marvel's Spider-Man. And then season three says Maximum Venom. And so I think this is where the show, they were getting their funding pulled or something. The first two seasons have 26 episodes. This season only has 12. Now you would think with this being the final season in the show and the fact that it's called the Maximum Venom, you better believe every episode out of all 12 are gonna be based around Venom and Spider-Man. No. I am Groot. Oh, this can't be good. All new Marvel Spider-Man Maximum Venom. <laughs> You serious? Three or four episodes in this season just deal with baby Groot, and that's another reason why I think it's kind of close and they're trying to tie in everything they can with the MCU. Because 2017, that was like around peak MCU, Guardians of the Galaxy 1 and 2 time of baby Groot being cute. Four episodes, I believe, deal with baby Groot and the Young Avengers. They don't commit to the Young Avengers bit. They have Miss Marvel, Ironheart, and Amadeus Cho, which is his own can of worms, but he's essentially just Hulkling. It follows them preparing what's going to happen for the end of the season with like a Venom arc, but we j basically just twiddle our thumbs and it's. I fell asleep during it. I don't know if that's because I was tired of watching this very mid-series or it's like, what are we doing with it? Like, the arc just was not interesting. 
but at the first half of season three, something happens. They make like Peter and Max Modell. Max Modell is essentially the principal of Horizon High. He's what you would think Otto Octavius would be if he wasn't evil, just a really kind hearted man who's very intelligent and is a great mentor to the kids. He and Spider Man make a synthetic spider suit with the Venom because they killed Venom or like the Venom symbiote, but they have a synthetic like symbiote, but then actually it's revealed that they didn't kill Venom. And so it's like Spider-Man fights the, the Venom symbiotes with the synthetic one. Venom takes a synthetic, then you have a really strong Venom. That's like four episodes. They finally defeat Venom. And then the last half, and really the only thing that stuck out to me about season three is an arc with Dr. Connors, which season two had the Jackal as the last big bad. Season 3 is essentially orchestrated by the Jackal and Norman Osborn, which we'll get to in a second. Dr. Connors basically finds out what Max has been doing with the Venom symbiotes. He's been experimenting on the side with it. And he goes to the school board and is like, hey, you gotta fire this guy. And so they put him on, like, temporary leave. And all of Max's friends and, like, students basically go on trial and speak for, on Max's behalf, saying, like, oh, he's such a good guy, blah, 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 blah. And then it's revealed that Dr. Connors knows Peter Parker as Spider-Man. He unmasks himself to the school, but it's not news. It's like only kept in the school that he's Spider-Man, which I don't know why it wouldn't break and be like at least New York City wide news. And then what ends up happening is Dr. Connors becomes the principal of the school. Max is fired. And then through Dr. Connors being the principal, Norman Osborn, who survived what had happened in season one, which was him just getting defeated essentially, is he is now like the puppet master once again doing the exact same thing he did in season one except using dr connors as his puppet because norman osborne is injured and he has the serum to keep dr connors from becoming the lizard very basic stuff and through using dr connors he enacts all these plots to get the own like venom symbiote to himself and he becomes the worst creature not only aesthetically looking, but just, it's so stupid. I don't know what was going on in 2017 um, or 2018 when the series, like season three was going on, but everyone had a hard on and like a huge fascination on Venom. There is a whole arc of Venom and other like Avengers and Marvel characters in this universe like bonding together so there was like the venom avengers venom groot venom cloak and dagger all this stuff and then the big bad in season three is what they call the dark goblin and look i'm all for like if you want to mix up like i said it's hard to write stories in the modern age of spider-man that are not tied to other past arcs or stories with spider-man media i get that so if you want to like inspire and take some stories from different points of media and then like switch them and make them your own that's totally fine, but make it good. Dark Goblin is Norman Osborn's dying because of goblin cancer, right? He injects himself with the goblin stuff to turn, like jackal DNA, to turn himself into the jackal, which is, I guess, this story's in universe explanation to make him, like, green, to look like the Green Goblin finally, which he could have just worn, like, the Power Rangers suit, like they did in Spider Man 1, but that's besides the point. And then he, like, gets the Venom symbiote that Dr. Connors stole from Max Modell to, like, fuse a Venom and, like, Jackal combination to become a goblin-esque creature. At, th at this point, if we're going for, like, the big brooding, like, goblin, just go do what they did in Ultimate Spider-Man, where you have the ultimate version of Green Goblin, where he's just a huge, a mass, like, Hulk version Hulk version sized goblin monster. This dark goblin venom esque creature with the jackal mixed in, it is, it's so stupid. And Norman being gone for two and a half, or like one and a half seasons, that's totally fine. I get it. That builds on the suspense of like who's orchestrating things, even though it's very obvious that it's Norman Osborn. But it's like, oh, where has Norman been? What's been going on? And then you have this creature that is supposed to be the payoff to the entire series. And he's a dark goblin, like Venom Jackal mix. At least commit to him being a goblin. But he is so easily defeated by Peter and Harry. It's laughable. He hires these, what I can only call goons, that, like, they try and make it, like, personalized to the other Spider people. So the Jackal, Miles Warren, is Gwen's uncle. They turn Miles' dad into Swarm. And then they get the chameleon to pretend to be Anya, Spider-Woman's sister, to have like a Penny Parker mech suit. And so it like gets all of the four Spider-Men spread out to fight like their one-on-one -on -one battles. And they all defeat the villains like that. Like it's hardly any struggle. It's supposed to be like an emotional thing. Like Miles finds out his dad is a bad guy. And then his dad's like, oh, I'm sad. And then just runs away. Gwen says, 
hey, uncle, quit being evil. And he says, I'm only being evil because I have other evil plans. So I'm going to like backstab Norman. And then they like stop fighting. And then Anya defeats the chameleon because the chameleon's not powerful. He's just driving a mech. And then she realizes, oh, okay, you're not my sister. So there's no emotional payoff at all. All four of them come together, beat the dark goblin so fast. And then that's basically it. Wait, no, there's two more episodes, which, why are we doing this? We had a huge, what felt like, series finale, and now there's two more episodes. I'm not going to get into details of it. It's so stupid. The last two episodes in this series are the real Venom is back, and then he gets cuckolded by Scream and other symbiotes that come from the Venom planet that they opened a portal to. And they're like, we're going to destroy the Earth. And it's just two episodes of standard spider symbiote stuff, and then the series ends once they defeat the bad guys. Very stupid. Now let's get into the things, I, the small things that I liked about this series. Um, after going through my notes, I think some of the only stuff I liked from this series were the superior Spider-Man arc and the fact that there's a little bit of world building that, like, if you're having three seasons, there's expected world building to happen, so that's not anything crazy. That's really about it. The characters of Max Modell and the contrast of him with Peter Parker and the rest of the kids at Horizon High... I would praise it, because that's a very interesting thing, and to my knowledge, that doesn't happen in a lot of Spider-Man comics, because he's normally like a standalone character that teams up with other characters on the side, but that's exactly what happened in Ultimate Spider-Man, and whether you love that series or like I do, or you're, you don't like it because of what it is, that's totally fine, but there's no way you don't realize it's like the exact same thing. All of the things from this season or this series that I like, I feel like they're just ripped and don't have as well of an adaptation from other forms of Spider-Man media. It's, uh, it's, it's like, I don't know why this series was made probably other than just to keep the rights to have a Spider-Man TV show. Finally, let's get into the meat and potatoes. Let's get into the good stuff. The, the, by good stuff, I mean the stuff I did not like, the stuff I hated about this series. Number one, they do a lot of telling and not showing. And if you're going to write any sort of script for a book, a movie, a TV show, show and then tell. Or show and don't tell. Because your audience, you have to remember, your audience is smarter than you are. An example of how this series tells but doesn't show is all four of the main spider people by season three two like halfway through it they all have their powers but they're not explaining when you get to season three how they're so skilled and you could just say yeah with time goes on but there's hardly any trial and error and that's my favorite part about watching superhero or just any hero's journey is the trial and error another instance is peter parker has to explain to max modell in episode two of season three why he won't go public with his identity because max finds out that spider-man is peter parker because he spends a lot of time with both of them and Peter basically is like, I can't let my loved ones get in danger, but doesn't elaborate at all. Max says like, oh, Iron Man gets public with his identity. All these people are. And Spider-Man's only answer is that he's not like, he's still a teenager. He's not an Avenger, which yes, that makes sense because of everything we know of Spider-Man and other forms of media. He's a, a little kid, he's a teenager, he's in high school, even though he's not predominantly in high school, but in this version he is. And it's like, yeah, you gotta keep your loved ones safe. That makes sense. But he doesn't say that, he's just like, oh, I'm not an Avenger. Max is the one who explains it to us, the audience, not Peter. A few episodes later, he's like, Peter, now I get why you don't go public with your identity. And Peter just looks at him and is like, mm-hmm. And then Max says, you gotta keep your loved ones, and does the explanation for us. And it's like, why was Peter not explaining this? But also, why don't we show instances of why? Peter can't just say, oh, to keep my loved ones safe, when nothing bad has ever happened to his loved ones. The only stuff that's, the only bad stuff that's happened to the people he cares about are his friends, and it's because they're at Horizon. <sighs> this, I'm gonna get a headache. Another annoying thing about this series is I spoke on this a little bit uh, regarding season three. There's so many different Venom plot lines, which if you have a character that is just, you're defeating them and they're coming back multiple, multiple times, Venom shows up, I think, in season one and is a constant threat until season three, but it's not like every episode is Venom. It's like, we defeated him, and then six episodes later, he's like, actually, I'm back now. And then it's just back, back and forth. It just lessens the impact of the overall character. By the time season three came out, or came around, and I realized, oh, it's Maximum Venom season, I didn't care because I had basically what felt like a whole season worth of episodes in the prior seasons that were all to deal with Venom. And it's like, I've had my Venom fix. I don't know if there's like a, a Venom agenda from the higher ups that are like pushing, go do Venom. But it was just like, why? It just lessens the impact of the overall character. This video is already getting long, but the last two things I want to say about what I don't like about this series is that in season three, how there's 12 episodes, 
the first half of each episode it just feels like filler. They were ha- they had to have hit a quota because there was twelve episodes in season three, and they're all put into like six different arcs with both of them having two episodes per arc. But there's no reason for each arc to have two episodes. All of them are very drawn out and monotonous. It just does not. There's no need for it. No explanation. No one wanted this. I'll speak for the people. No one wanted season three. And there were no plot points that like season two didn't wrap up. Season two felt like a good definitive ending, even though season two sucked. But there's characters at the beginning of season three that get thrown in like MJ. You know, you could say this is a... Uh, this is a little kid's show. This is a show about Spider-Man in high school. We're not going to push Peter Parker having a relationship because he's in high school. And high school boys definitely don't care about relationships. Like, no, 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 no. But that's fine. All through season two, one and two, there was nothing even hinted at of Peter Parker wanting to have a relationship with anybody. And then MJ moves in next door in season three. And all of a sudden, MJ's like head over heels for Peter. It's just, it's so weird. The final two episodes deal with a dance and she's like... Well, she basically asks Peter to be her date to Peter's dance because they go to different schools. Her and Peter never spend any time together throughout season three. He saves the day at the school dance and she kisses him on the cheek at the very end of the series and is like, we're going to have the rest of our lives to spend together or something like that. It... It just it felt so rushed, like, oh, what does Spider-Man do at the end of a Spider-Man story? He he gets with MJ and they tie a little bow on everything. It was so stupid. The last thing I want to say about my biggest like complaint with this series is that Peter Parker is so annoying. Yes, Spider-Man's annoying in a way of he is always joking and always coming up with quips to annoy his villains. That's one thing. This show is trying to push the Peter Parker is the smartest person in the room and the most annoying person in the room agenda full blast there's a reason why it's been so long between spider-man videos that i've made because after watching episode one of this series the first five minutes i couldn't finish episode one and i couldn't force myself to watch episode two there was about two weeks where i had a reminder on my phone every single day watch spider-man 2017 like let's get and i just couldn't bring myself to it because of Peter Parker. He gets better throughout the seasons. Peter Parker's annoyance and his millennial zany humor gets taken down a little bit, but that is the only way I can describe how annoying Peter and a lot of the characters are in this show, because yeah, they're all geniuses. They all have a millennial zany humor type dialogue of like, oh, this, this, and this, and then they like wink at the camera, and like, I'll play some clips right now of how annoying it is. That'll explain it more than I can. Name? Peter Parker. A P is in phosphorus. E is an electron. T is okay, in... okay, you're on the list. Oh, Speedo Palatine Gangleoneralgia. Oh, can't you just say brain freeze like everyone else? Oh, but that wouldn't be accurate. Of course I do. It's my first day in a new environment, so naturally my hands are processing the incoming sensory signals sent from my. Okay. Lastly, I had some enjoyment watching the series. I'm not gonna lie and say that I didn't enjoy it any of it but there's a good chunk of it that i just couldn't help myself but thinking like there's other series that do these things better if you want to watch the spider-man series about a group of ragtag teens that go out and fight the villains of new york whatever watch ultimate spider-man i know i keep referencing that if you want to watch a really emotional driven story of just standalone peter parker watch spectacular spider-man if you want to watch your own spider-man retro futuristic 2099 go watch spider-man unlimited there's so many different spider-man adaptations especially in the animated realm us spider-man fans are eating so well that this series has nowhere to fit in to say like watch me this is what i provide it just feels like every single thing that this series tries to do is pulling from other adaptations that have done it better and this series does not build upon any of the things that they're taking from the other series as well finishing out the tier list i'm gonna put this series at d tier i'm looking at it right now it's on par with the 60s spider-man in a sense that it's okay there's nothing special about it honestly i would rather watch the mtv spider-man series over this purely because it sucks but it's fun bad it's enjoyable i get why there's like a cult-like following behind this series because it's so stupid and funny. Spider-Man from the 60s and this Spider-Man from 2017, they're so bland and boring and the Spider-Man series from the 80s does everything better than the 60s and every other Spider-Man adaptation in the animated realm does everything a thousand times better than Spider-Man 2017. It's interesting for some of the Venom arcs, the Harry and Norman Osborn back and forth that they stole from Spectacular Spider-Man and then the Superior Spider-Man storyline. The rest of the series, nothing special. 
Hopefully, if you've made it this far into the video, you've either seen all of these series yourselves or you just got to witness my reaction and review to all of them. And that being said, it's time to adjust some of the things on this tier list accordingly because in my opinion, there's a difference in ranking between ranking and quality and then ranking in terms of enjoyment. Now this tier list is a mix of both since I'm not going to make two based on what I think is actually like the best series and what I've enjoyed the most. As I stated in my earlier reviews and you've heard me say multiple times throughout this video, I am a huge fan of Ultimate Spider-Man. Realistically, the reason I'm a huge fan of that show is because of the nostalgia I had of watching that show when I was in middle school. There's series in this throughout this tier list that I'm sure all of you guys have watched with growing up and that's the reason that's your favorite and that's totally fine. But in my opinion, there's things like Spider-Man 2017 I just talked about that might be your favorite, but that is definitively one of the worst series on this list. So that being said, I have to rank these in terms of what I enjoyed the most rather than what I think definitively is the best. But ultimately this tier list is a mix of both of those. So that being said, I need to adjust one or two things in this list. Looking at the tier list I have in front of me right now, I have to admit, I was way too harsh on the MTV Spider-Man series. I know that's a cult classic amongst a lot of Spider-Man viewers and fans of the character, but I think when I was watching this series, I was almost burnt out of doing this series. There was a long time of upload between my reviews of different series when I came to this one. So I'm going to move it from F tier back up. I'm going to be honest, I'm still not a huge fan of the series. But I'm going to put it at D tier instead of F tier. I know, I know, hearsay, whatever. It's my video. But I enjoyed the series as a standalone kind of what-if pocket dimension that it is in the Sam Raimi universe, even though it was discontinued. But I definitely don't think it's on par with Spider-Man 2017. That by far was the worst show. I had the least amount of enjoyment watching it besides the Superior Spider-Man arc. And also, it just didn't really resonate with me. So that being said, I'm moving Spider-Man 2017 down to F tier. And I think that's really the only thing I'm going to have to change about this, except bumping up some stuff into A tier, because right now I have nothing in A tier. And, and honestly, I'm just going to put Ultimate Spider-Man in A tier. Again, I know it's my video, but like I love that series so much. And then looking at B tier, it's empty. I think I'm going to have to put Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends in B tier, because yeah, it's basically the same thing as Spider-Man from the 1981 series, except... It's got Iceman and Firestar, so it's got a little bit of an edge up on it, which I think brings it up to that B tier. So then, but then now looking at the tier list, this is going to be my final definitive ranking for this series. That being said, if you've made it this far into the video or you've been watching every single one of my reviews for the past few months, genuinely from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much. This has been a long journey that I've tasked myself with kind of just because I wanted to. This was, I've never watched all these series before and I really just wanted to document myself reviewing and watching these series and I found along the way there's a few of you guys that want to watch and enjoy my content as well which genuinely thank you so much. Media is about consuming and enjoying what you like. I know that this list is not like the perfect list and trust me there's a lot of you that probably would want to rearrange a lot of these things but this is my list and ultimately what it comes down to is what you and I the audience enjoy out of these series I want to hear back from you guys let me know in the comments what you think of these rankings let me know what you think of these reviews and let me know what you think about this video lastly if you've made it this far into the video please consider subscribing it genuinely means so much to me it just lets me know that you guys enjoy the content that I'm making and want to see more and I'll keep making more because of it but that's really all I have for now thank you guys so much for watching Take care. Bye. It's been great meeting you. Take care of yourself.